If you're ready to level up your SMMA Seals ability, you find yourself in the right place. This SMMA Seals Masterclass is going to blow your freaking mind how much value and how much absolutely insane resources and training is in this masterclass. So strap yourselves in, get a coffee, get a notepad and pen because this is going to be absolutely insane. So Seals. It is the name of the game in SMA. You can book all the sales meetings in the world. You can book all the meetings, all the sales calls. If you cannot close a prospect, if you can take a prospect from not knowing you to paying you for your service. If you're not able to do that, then you can book all the meetings in the world. It does not matter. And I'm gonna show you step by step how to do that, how to get your sales percentage, how to get your closing percentage as high as possible in this masterclass. So let's get straight into it. So what we're going to cover, we're going to cover meeting preparation. So what you do before the call to prepare the meeting, to put the foundations in place, to give yourself the best possibility, the best chance to close in the first place. Super important and something people forget about all the time. Then we're going to look at the sales call script. I'm going to walk you through the step-by-step -step script that's closed over 250 clients for my agency. Then we're going to look at sales psychology. Super important. Psychology is so, so important in sales because ultimately sales is all about psychology. You're trying to reframe and reset someone's mindset from not wanting to pay you to paying you. So really, really important. Then we're going to look at what we do and what we say to secure the close. And then we're going to look at sales principles. What principles, what foundations do we need to have in place for every single sales calls in order to be successful? Then we're going to look at building our answer vault. You're going to get asked questions, common questions all the time. And we want to create an answer vault where we have really, really polished, clean and effective answers for those questions. Then we're going to look at the big one, objection handling. In sales, you're going to have four main objections. You're going to have price objection. You're going to have a fear objection. You're going to have a partner objection and you're going to have a time objection. We're going to go through each four of them in super detail. And I'm going to give you all the answers and all the reframing and resetting and diffusing scripts and templates in order to absolutely kill it with objection handling and then price objection which is the most common objection the agency space has its own lesson and i go into that in even more detail then we're going to look at how you onboard a client once you get the close and then we're going to look at how we set up calendly to make sure we have the right questions in place to make sure we have the right reminders set up to make sure we have a confirmation page set up all of these really really important things to make sure people actually show up on your calls super super important but first and foremost before we actually get into it who am i I don't want to spend too much time on this because this sales masterclass is about you and improving your sales ability. I want to give you as much value as possible, but it's important you know who you're learning from. So who am I? Back in 2021, I started my SMMA in my parents' bedroom. So just three, four years ago, not a very long time at all. And ever since, I have been obsessed with growing it. I'm very, very passionate about the agency model. I'm very passionate about how well you can do with it, the opportunity out there. And I've been obsessed with growing my agency ever since I started it and I've come a long way. My agency has literally changed my life forever. It's allowed me to travel the world, you know, drive my dream cars, meet other seven figure entrepreneurs. It has literally given me the opportunities that I would never have dreamed of. And I want you to kind of get your opportunity to buy into the agency model and to really go out there and build the life of your dreams. And you know, we're doing pretty good. You know, 48,000 pounds per month, 60,000 USD. You know, not too many people would sniff their nose at that. So we're doing pretty good. But again, I don't wanna to spend too much time on me. This video is about you and giving you as much value, but it's important you know that I actually know what I'm talking about. So before we get into it, one more thing I wanna discuss. I have this course and many other courses completely for free in a school community called Agency Accelerator Free. You have access to this on YouTube, but if you want to go and join the free community on school, it will have it laid out lesson by lesson by lesson and will be easier for you to digest. And a little cherry on top, the next 50 people that join Agency Accelerator Free get a free one-on-one -on -one warm up call. So completely insane. If you wanna go over, jump over to school and join Agency Accelerator Free, the most insanely valuable free community for agency owners in the market. But let's not waste any more time. Without further ado, let's get into the SMMA Sales Masterclass. Meeting preparation. So why preparing for your meeting is really, really important. Prepare, prepare, prepare for the potential prospect that you are speaking to. So do your due diligence. What social media are they currently using? Do they currently run any ads? I'm going to show you in a second how you can actually check are they running any ads themselves and how you can actually check their competitors and what ads they're running. Are they underperforming? Are their ads underperforming? You can tell pretty quickly on their ads if they've been run for a long time or in terms of the length they've been run on Facebook ads library. Obviously, the longer they've been run, they must be pretty successful. They wouldn't be continuing to run an ad if it was unsuccessful. So you can see if they're turning off a lot of ads, then they're obviously are underperforming. Are they currently posting content? 
is their engagement low and why? You know, how many likes is their content getting? Is their content getting comments? Is their content high quality, low quality? Do they have any competitors? This is super, super important because you can check if maybe some competitors are running some really successful ads and you can put them into a presentation or put them into a few slides and show the potential prospect on a call. You can say, look, this is the kind of direction we're going to go in. This is your competitor in X location and they're running these ads. We think these could work really, really well. And then what areas you think you could help them with? Really, really important you write down every single one of these questions and have an answer for them to propose and to present to the client on a call. So Facebook Ads Library. I'm sure you all have aware of Facebook Ads Library, but anybody who doesn't, Facebook legally have to show exactly what ads every single company is running. So you can go right up to Gymshark, one of the biggest e-com brands in the world, or you can go to a local brick and mortar company and you can see exactly what ad they're using, what type of copy they're using, um, how long the ad's been running for. It's actually a bit of a cheat code and it's insanely powerful. So use this to look up the current company that you're speaking to. Use this to look up their competitors. Use this to create a few foundational solid ads that you could say, look, this is where we want to go. This is the kind of creative we're thinking of. This is the kind of copy we're thinking of. And really, really do your research on this. This is kind of addictive. I love going on ads library and just kind of being nosy and seeing what kind of ads other businesses are using. It's really, really powerful. So make sure to make a note of that and use Facebook ads like library. Write everything down. Have all of their key pieces of information written down on your notepad ready for the meeting. So when you're discussing the project with the potential client, you can say things like, I noticed your competitor DP supplements is posting this type of content and their audience is engaging with it really, really well. This shows a massive, massive amount of application and that you've done your homework and builds great rapport with the client because they're going to be thinking, okay, this guy's obviously looked into my company. He's looked into our competitors. He's done a little bit of research on what content we could post. It's going to be really, really good and it's going to show them that you're actually putting in that extra bit of work. Play to the crowd. Be very conscious of who you're speaking to. How you deal with an insurance company is going to be very, very different to how you deal with a fashion brand. Read that again. How you deal with an insurance company is going to be very, very different to how you deal with a fashion brand. So obviously, if you're speaking to an insurance company, it's going to be a lot more corporate. It's going to be a lot more commercial, you know, a little bit uptight. You're going to have to be a little bit more careful about what you say. Whereas if you're speaking to a fashion brand, they're probably a little bit more laid back. Like the company culture of a fashion brand is going to be laid back. You can maybe be yourself a little bit more. You can crack jokes, build rapport. So be very, very conscious of who you're speaking to what industry they're in and what type of person and what type of business they run. This is something you'll get better at as you grow your agency, but be very aware of this before the call. Your mannerisms and your rapport will be very, very different depending on the niche, depending on the company. Zoom. So all of our meetings are held on Zoom and that obviously was discussed in the software stack and the tools and software's lesson. However, we need to prepare Zoom for our sales meetings. So make sure you have your name on your Zoom account Make sure you have a professional picture. This can be a selfie or whatever. It could be your agency logo. It was my agency logo on my Zoom account for years. Make sure that your background is professional. You know, if you're hopping on a sales call with a potential prospect, don't have your background be like your bed with all like your dirty laundry like all over the room. You can blur your background on Zoom, but make sure your background is very presentable. It's so, so important. You don't want a very unprofessional background. You're gonna lose credibility. You're gonna lose authority and the company is not gonna take you seriously. Make sure you have screen sharing enabled because there's nothing worse if you're hopping on a call and you can't share your screen and you're like messing around with your keyboard and you're trying to get up your presentation and maybe you share the wrong screen. It doesn't look good. So make sure you have screen sharing enabled and make sure you have all of that set up pre the call. Make sure there will be zero interruptions for the duration of the call. So this goes back to the mindset module and kind of like your workspace, your setup. Make sure you are somewhere where you're not gonna be interrupted. What do you think is going to happen if you're in the middle of a sales call and your mom or your dad comes in the back and it's like messing around your room or is calling you for dinner? Super unprofessional. You're going to lose all credibility. You're going to lose all authority. Make sure you're in a room with zero interruptions for the total duration of the call. This is really, really important that you have absolutely zero interruptions. Have a notepad and pen beside your laptop. Be constantly taking notes on what the client is saying, what the prospect is saying, their pain points, where they want to get to, their goals. Be constantly taking notes on this. This is really, really important. And you can actually tell them that on the call if you're looking down at your notepad and pen and it kind of looks like maybe you're not listening to them. Just look up and say, look, John, just so you know, I'm taking notes here in case you think I'm not listening to you. I'm still listening. I'm just taking notes. So that is Zoom. Make sure all of that is prepared and ready for the call. Really, really important. Look, it's as simple as this, guys. If you don't prepare for sales calls, 
calls, you're not going to do as well as someone who does prepare for sales calls. Sales calls are the bread and butter of your agency. You need to put yourself in the position to do as well as possible. You need to put the foundations in to do as well as possible, especially at the start when you're not going to be as confident, when you're not going to be as charismatic, when you don't have your objection handling nailed in, when you don't have everything dialed in. You need to really make up for that in your prep. Your prep is super important, so you really need to have it dialed in. All of the things in this lesson are super, super important. Make sure you do each and every single one of them. Take notes, write it down, learn this, have it dialed in. I'll see you in the next lesson. What's going on everyone and welcome to this lesson on sales call structure. In this lesson, I'll be taking you through the exact sales script I use to land clients in my agency, how to structure your calls, how to sell to clients emotionally and logically, and a few tips and tricks on how I get my conversion rate as high as possible. So in part one, we're gonna build rapport, we're going to warm up the call. So when we get on the call with a potential client, we don't wanna go straight in with sales. They won't like that very much. You gotta warm them up a little bit, ask them how they're doing, how's their morning going, You know, refer to where they are, say you've heard great things about their area, city, state, maybe something about the weather, and just come across as enthusiastic and as friendly as possible. If we go down to part two then, setting up the call and taking control, we'll say something like, okay, great, let's jump right into the call. So whatever their name is. How this call will go is, I will start off by asking you some questions about your business goals and any other challenges you're having. Then we can determine if it sounds like we're a good fit and we can work together coming towards the end of the call. I do this by asking a few questions about you, your business, what you've previously done, what you want to do in the future, and ultimately what you're looking to accomplish or get help with. Then if it seems like we're a good fit, I can explain what we do, how it works, and I'll let you know either way, you'll get some value out of today's call. Now, you don't have to sit and read this like a robot. Obviously, it's a very fluid thing. You can just, you know, you can riff off it, or if you want to read it off by heart, you know, that's what you can do. Usually, when I'm on a sales call, I will have my Zoom open on half the screen, and I will have my script over here like this. So this will be my script and this will be my Zoom call. So I'm facing the computer and it looks to the client like I'm looking right at them, but I'm looking at the script, which is keeping me right and it's telling me what to say and when to say it. So we'll bring that back out like this and we will go to part for three. Find your prospects why. So this brings back to the emotive selling that we discussed in previous lessons. So clients buy on 80% emotion and 20% logic. So we'll say things like, so tell me what you think your biggest motivation was for taking the time out today for scheduling this call with me. And they'll say things like, you know, I'm trying to get my business more revenue. I'm being worked to the bone. I've got no time to do marketing. And then you ask questions like, why do you believe you're experiencing this? Why is this important to you? What have you done previously to try and fix this? How long has this been going on? And all these different questions. And what we're doing is trying to strip away and get to the clients why. You know, why do they really want this? We're gonna strip it back and back and back as much as we can and bring out as much emotion as possible. For part four, it's called the assessment. So we've brought out the emotion, we've stripped the client back and back and back, and we've built a little bit of rapport. So now we're gonna slowly edge towards logic. So we're gonna ask them to give a brief rundown of the business. And if they don't give it in their brief rundown, you can ask things like, what are they selling? How are they getting their customers? What sales processes do they have? How does their pricing work? It's so lots of questions here. You see it's in a lot of detail. Every sales call, I don't ask all of these questions, obviously, because we'd be there forever. However, there is some really important ones. So it's important you ask things like, what's your ideal client or dream buyer? You know, what product does the best for you? A lot of the time in e-commerce, 80% of the revenue is from a few products. So these are really, really important questions. And this is when we're slowly edging towards logic. So figuring out where they want to go. If we were having this conversation, 12 months from today, and we're looking back at the past 12 months, what would need to happen for you to be happy with your results? Now this question is absolutely phenomenal, and it was taught to me by a mentor of mine, and it really changes things with the client, because you will always hear them say things like, wow, I've never been asked that before. Wow, that's made me think, you know, what do I want from this relationship? Is it gonna be a revenue change? Is it gonna be a lifestyle change? And then they're gonna answer, and you're gonna say this, okay, what is your motivation for achieving this? And once they say that, once they say what their motivation for achieving that is, you're gonna find out what type of client they're gonna be. So if they talk really passionately, they're really enthusiastic, they're like, I'll do whatever it takes, you tell me what you need and I'll get you it. You know they're gonna be a really, really good client. 
But if they're a little bit lethargic and they're like, hmm, I don't know, do I really want that? Do I really want this? You're, the alarm bells are going to start ringing in your head and you're going to be like, do I really want to take this person on as a client? But this, again, this is really, really important information and this is vital into understanding why the client wants to take you on and use your services. So part six is the admission. So I understand you ultimately want to get more customers. Why do you think you haven't been able to accomplish this yet and what have you been doing? So they're again, they're going to say, I haven't been getting enough sales, I don't know about marketing, blah, blah, blah. They're going to say all the excuses under the sun. And you're going to say, well, what have you been doing specifically to address this? Why is this important for you to figure out and get it working? On a scale of 1 to 10, how important is this for you? Again, stripping back, trying to bring their emotions to the forefront, and really trying to understand them as a person. And then we get to delivering value, the emotional side of things. Sorry, the logical side of things. We brought out the emotion and now we're going to back it up with logic. So, okay, name. well, based on what we've discussed, you're currently at X, experiencing Y, and you want to be at C. I can definitely help you with that. Would you like me to show you a little of how we could do that and what would be involved? So, this bit is what I say. This doesn't have to be what you say. This is what I say. Obviously, tinker this to your agency, but it goes like, as a business, we actually vet who we work with in massive detail. We don't just work with anyone, as from years of experience, taking on clients that aren't a good fit result in huge headaches for us both down the line. We look at your website, ads, spend, competition, CRO, keyword ranking, in order to confirm whether we can scale your business. We perform client audits that give me a complete guarantee that 99%, if not 100% of agencies aren't confident enough to dish out. If we as an agency aren't able to increase your revenue and produce results, we work for free and return your investment. So this is a really, really good way of putting their minds at ease. You're telling them, if we can't do what we're going to say we do, we're going to return your investment. We know there is rampant skepticism in this industry and it's full of pretenders, so I'm very confident we would flourish together. I'm taking all the risk away from you by guaranteeing results. How does that sound? So usually when you say something like this, this is the first time they've heard this. They're like, this guy is going to work and if he doesn't do what he's going to say, he's going to give me the money back. They're going to feel very, very comfortable and they're going to trust you because you're offering them a fantastic service. So part eight, getting commitment. You're going to ask them how they enjoyed that. You said, we think we can both agree there's a great opportunity here. And then obviously mention what they want, their desired outcome. And then say something like, does that sound like the type of help you're looking for? And then it looks like you're great for, for my program. Do you want to hear how it works? Part nine, the prescription. So again, this is for my agency. You don't have to use this for your agency. You can tweak this. If you're doing social media management, you can tweak this. But I say we launch innovative and hyper-targeted social media ad campaigns that truly resonate with your ideal customer to grow your business for the long term. We do away with the inefficiencies that plague other agencies. We have no huge overheads, fancy offices that inflate your service fee. We are fully remote and our methods are data-driven. We focus on one thing, paid ads, and the platforms we offer are Facebook, Instagram, Google, Snapchat, TikTok, LinkedIn, YouTube. And then you go on to mention, you say, there's a full done-for-you service on advertising platforms. Depending on your preference, we can have as much contact or as little contact. Every business owner is different. In terms of what's included, campaign research, setup, optimization, scaling, reporting, and all communication is done on Slack via Looms. If we work together, you'll have predictability in your business, more time, more money, less stress, greater freedom, and increased security. So again, we're set on logically, but we're coming back to that emotional brain where we're bringing that in to what they want. Then part 10, temperature check. Okay, Niam, based on what we've discussed, why do you feel you would be a good fit for this program? Now, this is a really, really important question. We're sort of turning it back on them. You know, why do you think you should work with me? A lot of the time, agency owners are begging clients for their service. You know, we want your retainer. Come on, please work with me. But this is turning it back on the client. You know, why should I work with you? You know, sell yourself to me. And then all, you, the client will all of a sudden start being like, oh, well, we have this revenue. We have this great product. We have this great content. And it turns the whole situation around. And if we keep going down, there's obviously a lot more questions. This is like going through what they might say and questions you can ask following up. Then we come to the close, so part 11. So, when it comes to the investment to get started today and finally achieve X, which is what you discussed previously, 
you've got three options. So this is a little trick I really like to use, and it works a lot. You've got three packages, your high-level package, your mid-level package, and your light package. So going into this, we know in all likelihood they're going to go for the light package, maybe the mid-level package if they've got a lot of revenue. However, say we price each package, the high-level package at 3,000, the mid-level at 2,000, and the light package at 1,000. Just by saying 3,000, it makes our light package, which is what the one we want them to take, look like a fantastic deal. That's the one we want them to take. But by saying this high-level package, Facebook ads, Google ads, TikTok ads, social media management, at 3,000, even though we know they're most likely not going to take that, it makes our light and mid-level package look like a really good deal. And when they think of all the services we're going to offer, all the emotive language we use, we built rapport, and they like us as a person, and then they think we're giving them a really good deal, they're more than likely going to go with that. They're going to go with the light package for a 1,000, and we're going to say... Oh, I wish you would go for the high level package as I think it would work really well with your brand, but we're more than happy to work with you on the light package. And then boom, you have them on the light package. And then as you're discussing this, you're going to say, okay, all packages have a £350 setup fee, by the way. Now, you might be thinking, that's a bad idea. You don't want to put them off. Setup fee, you know, what's that for? Why are we saying that? When we go down to this next bit, as a call to action or as a little push for them to take this package we're offering, we're going to say, well, whatever their name is, as mentioned, there is a £350 setup fee. However, I have found those who are able to make decisions quickly, be decisive and take action are my best type of clients. So for that reason, if we can get this sorted today and take payment on the call, I'll waive the £350 setup cost off your investment. How does that sound? Now this is an excellent strategy you can use and a little trick at the end of the call to just give them that little bit of push. And all being well, you'll close the client, they'll say that's a brilliant deal, let's go with that, the mid-level package or the light package, and you'll say congratulations, welcome aboard, you've made a great decision today about moving forward, taking action and reaching your goals. And that's it guys, that's the sales call structure. Now, you're not going to get it perfectly on your first sales call. I'll say it probably took me 15 to 20 sales calls before I really learned this. But after about five, I'd say, you'll know it pretty well. And you'll have it again to the side of the screen when you're on your calls. And a lot of the time, you don't need to look at it. But use this as your structure, and I promise you it will increase your conversions. So make a copy of this, put it in your agency Google Drive, and that's that for this lesson. So welcome to this lesson on sales psychology. In this lesson, we're going to be diving into the different parts of the brain, how we sell logically, how we sell emotionally, and how we can relate that back to SMA. So let's get into it. First and foremost, I want to tell you about Daniel Goleman. Daniel Goleman is a psychiatrist and an author, and he wrote three books called Emotional Intelligence, Social Intelligence, and Working with Emotional Intelligence. And right now, I want you to go and buy at least one of these books. If you really want to knock this out of the park and absolutely master SEAL psychology and master psychology in general, you will go and get three of these books because they will change your life forever. So his number one bestseller is Emotional Intelligence. And basically, that book discusses how we can master our emotions in certain situations, why we get angry, why we get sad, how we can prevent those things, how the human brain actually works. It is an absolutely brilliant book. I've read it about three times. I've got the hardback copy and I've got it on Audible. It's a phenomenal book and it really, really opens up your eyes to how the brain works, how emotions work and how actually being emotionally intelligent is one of the most important traits in life, let alone business. It is so, so important. Then he followed it up with a book called Social Intelligence, which is essentially how to use emotional intelligence in social situations. So with your family or with your friends or whoever it may be, when your friend annoys you or says something or your sister annoys you or your brother annoys you, how to deal with that situation, what actual chemicals and what actual processes are going on in your brain to allow those things to happen. It's a phenomenal book and really, really is brilliant, not only for learning how to deal with people in certain situations, but also learning how to deal with family dynamics, friend dynamics, and really, really maturing you and helping you understand how the brain works. And then finally, almost perfectly intertwining into what we're talking about here, he relates it to business. So working with emotional intelligence. 
And you can see there the New York Times, anyone interested in leadership should get a copy of this book. So in this book, it's more how to use emotional intelligence for leadership, how to use emotional intelligence in the workspace, how to use emotional intelligence with colleagues, with staff members, with managers, with whoever it may be. Really, really great book. And these books are a phenomenal foundation for sales because it helps you understand how the human mind actually works and how we can sell emotionally, how can we can pull on people's heartstrings to increase our conversions and how we can really, really strategically learn how the brain works and feed that into our sales psychology, feed that into our sales strategy and feed that into how we actually conduct our sales calls. Really, really good stuff. I would really recommend going and getting all three of these if you can. If not, go and get Emotional Intelligence. You can pick it up at a bookstore for like $10. It's one of the most famous books around on, on the psychology. It's absolutely brilliant. If anything, you learn how the brain works, which I guess we should probably know more about seeing how important it is. So the brain. The brain is made up of three different parts. The primal brain, which is responsible for heart rate, impulses, survival. You know, you've probably heard of fight or flight mode. That is the primal brain. Then you've got the limbic system, which is responsible for emotions. And we're going to get into a little bit of how that is important. And then we have gray matter, which is responsible for logic. When we're selling SMMA services, people buy with emotion. They make decisions with 80% emotion and 20% logic. We must sell to their emotional brain first. So what do I mean by that? If you've ever been on a sales training call with me or if you've ever had a one-to-one -one coaching call with me, I will be massive on make the prospect like you. If they like you, they are so much more likely to buy from you. It doesn't actually even matter what service you have. Your offer is obviously really, really important. But if they like you, if you build rapport, if you build trust, if you build credibility, if you build authority, they are so much more likely to buy off you. And that's what I mean by people buy with emotions. They are going to tell themselves, this seems like a really nice guy. He seems like he knows what he's doing. He's funny. He's smart. He's charismatic. I like this guy. And their emotional brain is going to tell them, I'm going to give this guy a shot. I'm going to pay this guy to run my Facebook ads for my decking company or for my roofing company or for my solar company or whatever it may be. They're making a decision with their emotional brain. 80% emotion and 20% logic. So say things like, imagine all the doors improved marketing could open up for you. You know, obviously, as we go through the sales call script and the sales call structure, you'll be finding their pain points. You'll be finding why they're even on the call in the first place. And a lot of that is going to be, we don't have enough sales. You know, our pipeline is a roller coaster. It's good one month. It's bad the next month. We have no leads on autopilot. You know, I'm sick doing this and chasing my sales team and, and having to worry about sales. And you're going to say to them, imagine all the doors improved marketing could open up for you. You know, we could have your lead gen on autopilot. You could have a conveyor belt of high quality leads and high quality sales coming in every single month. That's going to free up you. You're going to sleep better. You're going to have improved family life, which leads into the next one. Imagine all the extra free time you're going to have. You know, with these leads on autopilot, you're going to have so much extra free time. You're going to be able to spend more time with your family. You're going to be able to maybe teach Mondays and Fridays off. You're going to have more money coming in. You're going to be stress free. You're going to feel better. You're going to have more energy. All of this stuff is we're pulling on their emotional heartstrings. We're showing them what they could have. Really, really important. Imagine the feeling of growing and expanding your business. You know, you've been stuck on 100K revenue or 500K revenue for the last five years. Imagine that feeling when that gets up to six, seven, or even a one million plus. Imagine how you and your family are going to feel. You're going to feel great. You're going to have a great sense of fulfillment, a great sense of enjoyment, happiness. Imagine spending more time with your family and children. This is a really, really important one. You know, obviously, if you stick to the sales structure that we discussed in our previous lesson, you're going to be asking them about their family life, about their children, about why they actually run a business, all of this good stuff. And you are really going to sell the dream of, you know, once we get all these leads and sales on autopilot, you're going to have so much more time, money and resources to spend on your family. It's going to be great. You're going to absolutely love it. Your life is going to change again, pulling on their emotional heartstrings. You really have to dig into their emotions and show them what their business could look like, what their life could look like, what they could look like as an entrepreneur, as a person. Really, really important. Once we spike their emotion, we back it up with logic. So remember, 80% emotion, 20% logic. Really, really important. Remember that we're going to spike their emotion and then we're going to back it up with logic. And we do this on the sales call by digging into their emotions, digging into their pain points at the start of the call. And then as we go out throughout the call, we show them things like your previous results, client testimonials, statistics backing up the power of social media, break down exact ROIs, average ROI in your industry, etc., etc. Really, really important. 
we spike their emotions, we really pull on their heartstrings, show them what they could have, and then we show them practically and logically how that's going to happen. Here, look at this decking company we worked with last month. You know, they're spending $3,000 per month and we had a return of $20,000. You know, could your company use that? That's a 5X ROAS or a 6X ROAS. You know, could your company use that? Here's John that we worked with in Texas. John started out, he, his sales were super low. He was getting really frustrated. He was stuck in the business. Now we put his leads on autopilot. He takes Friday off to pick his kids up from school and spend with his wife. His business has doubled in revenue. You know, is this something that you could want? Or the statistics, like in module one, we talked about how social media is growing and growing year on year. You know, do you want to be left behind? You know, here's your competitor who's pumping Facebook ads and has 3,000 followers on social media. Look how well they're doing. Do you want to be left behind? Do you want to let them steamroll you while you kind of like mess around here and you don't really know what you're doing? You're spinning the hamster wheel. Your company's not progressing. You know, where do you want to go from here? That's what you're doing. You spike their emotions at the start and now you're backing it up with logic. And if you do this correctly and as you do more and more sales calls, this will be very, very effective and very, very powerful and will increase your conversions hugely. Remember, spike their emotions and then hit them with logic. It's all about pulling on their heartstrings, showing them what they could have, showing them what their business could potentially do. And once their business hits that goal or hits that mark, how their life will look, how they will feel as an entrepreneur. Are they gonna be happy? Are they gonna be ecstatic? You know, are they gonna have more time to f spend with their family? And then once you have all of that, once they feel those emotions and once they're like, yeah, that's what I want, that's why I'm here, that's why I'm on this call. Once they feel all of that, that's their emotion spiked and then we're gonna hit them with credibility, we're gonna hit them with practicality, we're gonna hit them with logic, we're gonna show them previous testimonials, we're gonna show them previous results and they're gonna be like, okay, let's do this. So really, really important lesson, go and purchase those three books I discussed. They're gonna turn you into an absolute mindset psychology king. And remember, we're spiking emotions and then backing up with logic. See you in the next lesson. So securing the close on the call. In this lesson, we're gonna be talking about why it's really, really important to strike while the iron's hot. And if we have a client that we think we have a really good rapport with, that we think will be a really, really good fit, and they're just on the fence, how we can put the hammer down and secure them there and then on the call. So securing the close on the call, the best way to secure a client is to close them on that initial call. We want to strike while the iron is hot, and we wanna be pushier rather than soft selling them. The reason that we do this is if they go off that call, someone else can go and close them, they can forget and lose interest, they can change their mind, they can speak to their wife, their brother can talk them out of it. You will find in sales, if you do not get them closed on that first call, naturally human human nature is to find a hundred reasons to find a reason why they don't want to work with you like it's just their natural instinct they don't want to spend money they don't want to go with you they're nervous people are kind of very conservative with their money these days so they're going to find a hundred reasons not to work with you so how can we use tips and strategies and techniques to secure them on that call so we can use scarcity there are some strategies you can use to prompt the client to make a decision what you could do is you could tell the potential client you usually have a setup fee of $250. However, if we could get this over the line on the call right here, right now, I'd be willing to waive the setup fee and get you set up ASAP. You could say something like, you know, we have a few clients waiting to onboard, but I'm going to shoot you right to the front of the queue because I think you would be an amazing testimonial. I think we would do so, so well together. And I'm going to shoot you right to the front of the queue, get you set up within the next couple of days, get your ads launched within one week, and I'm going to completely waive that setup fee. That way you've added scarcity, you've built a bit of rapport, you've added a bit of generosity, and they're gonna be a lot more likely to go with you. You could also tell the potential client you only have a few spots left before you're at full capacity. So you could tell the client, you know, I only work with 10 prospects or 10 clients at one time. Us as an agency, we put huge, huge value on the quality of clients as opposed to quantity, and we find that 10 clients is actually our sweet spot. So when we add a couple more clients in, we're pretty much gonna close up shop and we're not gonna be bringing on anyone. So you really need to get in now if you wanna get a chance to work with us. That's again, adding scarcity. Then at the bottom, yes, we only take on a certain number of clients, say 15 to 20 if they ask, to make sure my team and I can produce the highest quality of work. So yes, going back to what I just said, you can say we only work with 10 or so clients and we are literally about to hit full capacity. And once we hit full capacity, we're very, very strong and passionate about closing off them because we know if we take on any more than 10 clients, we're simply spread too thin and we can provide a really, really high quality service. And that again is adding scarcity and is gonna make them want to work with you ASAP. Waving the setup fee makes you look generous and also pushes them to move fast. Not just the setup fee, the other things we discussed there as well, it's putting the onus on them. It's saying, look, if you wait out, it's gonna cost you more money. If you wait out, you're potentially gonna miss this opportunity. And again, this goes back to you finding their pain points. You know, if we don't work together, you know, where are you gonna be six months from now? 
Six months from now, you're going to be in the exact same place. You're going to be frustrated. Your sales are going to be low. You're going to be unhappy. You're not going to have made any progress. So really, really important to put the hammer down and push some scarcity on them to make them make that decision. Remember, going into a sales call, there is always the number one priority of closing the client there. And then again, back to the first slide, strike while the iron is hot. Really, really important. There and then you've built rapport, you've built pain points, you know, they've seen you, they've seen what you have to offer, they've seen you and then your agency. As you build your agency, you will see the amount of clients that change their mind after you haven't closed them on your calls. So this is crazy and it's really, really frustrating. Even in all of my business, if you speak to someone on a call and they give you your word and they give you, yes, I'm gonna come on today, I wanna work with you, it accounts for absolutely nothing. Like it is crazy the amount of people that tell you they're gonna do one thing and they get off the call and they speak to their brother, they speak to their mom, they speak to their wife and they completely change their mind. Like I've had people that said they love me, my, they love the agency, they love the testimonials, they think we'd be phenomenal together, they think we do amazing things and they get off the call and I never hear from them again. Like it's insane. They just speak to someone, they change their mind, they ghost you, and it's a lot easier to ghost you than to come back and look, be like, look, I changed my mind, I don't wanna work with you, because it makes them look silly, because they've said all of the things they've said in terms of they're dying to work with you, it sounds amazing. So it just makes them sound silly, and they'll just ghost you. So that's why, and that's why I'm saying I left a lot of money on the table to learn from my mistakes. I just took people for face value. You know, when someone was saying to me at the start, and I was incredibly naive, and I was new to sales, and new to obviously closing clients, I just took them, if someone said to me, I think you're great, I think you're amazing, I wanna work with you, just give me a few days, I gotta tie up a few things my end. I was like, great. I basically considered that a close. I was like, amazing, sounds good. I was telling my friends and family I got another client. No, not at all. You could not be more mistaken and do not fall into that false sense of security because that means absolutely nothing. It counts for absolutely nothing. People's word over the internet counts for absolutely nothing. So always 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 go for the close on the call and if someone is telling you how amazing you are and they want to work with you just say okay great what's stopping you from from coming on now what's stopping you from putting down a deposit to lock in your place what's stopping you from x y and z what's stopping you from financially committing to this and try and get that financial commitment because you will be guaranteed nine times out of ten when someone says they want to work with you they're going to come back and they'll, they'll change their mind or they'll ghost or they'll find someone else so there's a million reasons for them to do that let's get them nailed down on the call that being said, the last bullet point, you won't always be able to close them. However, it should be the aim. A minimum, 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 some sort of financial commitment off them. Because psychologically, if they put down some sort of financial commitment, it 10x is the likelihood of you working together. So try and get a small deposit off them to lock in their place. Very, very worst case scenario. And like literally the last, last line of defense is you get them booked in for another call. If you can't get any financial commitment off them, you get them booked in for another call. That means you have something in the diary, they've committed to another call, and you at least have that. Sales principles. In this lesson, we're gonna be looking at the principles and foundations that we need to have dialed in, that we need to have in place in order to go ahead and knock it out of the park with our sales process. So, we need to utilize silence. After asking a question to let prospects speak freely we don't want to keep jumping in and jumping in on prospects and asking left right and center we really really want to use silence as an asset and allow prospects to reveal more about themselves and their situation leverage the information obtained to close the deal effectively you would be absolutely shocked at the amount of information and at the amount of like private confidential information the prospects will tell you if you just sit there and listen and allow them to speak freely you'll be absolutely shocked at the amount of information they will reveal and you can use that as assets you can use it as leverage you can use it as ammunition come towards the end of the sales call against that prospect non-judgment avoid judging prospects based on financial status or decisions remain unbiased and open-minded during the entire call and create a trustful and non-threatening atmosphere for prospects so when the prospect reveals there maybe have some financial issues or their status or whatever it may be ultimately you don't want this to ever happen really because you want to pre-frame them before they even get on the call whether that's asking them questions in the dms whether that's asking them questions over email whether that's having a calendly form to allow them to book in and put down certain things 
you want to have them pre-framed and pre-qualified. So you don't really want this happening a lot, but when it does happen, you want to go into it with an open mind. You want to go into it with a trustful and non-threatening atmosphere for the prospects. Let them sweat the gravity of their situation. Ask difficult questions about their problems and pains and let the prospects feel the impact of their situation and pain points. Motivate them to take action by understanding the urgency for change. So this go back to pulling on their emotion heartstrings, pulling on their pain points, using the script structure and really getting a very, very good feel for their situation. Find out what makes them tick. Find out why they started this business in the first place and where they want to get to. In an ideal world, what do they want? Do they want 100K of revenue a month where they can take two days off to spend with their family? Or do they want a million a month? You know, they're just financially driven. Find out what their pain points, what's stopping them from getting to that and tell them how you can get them that desired results. Ultimately, you want them to understand the gravity of their situation. Unwavering confidence. Exude genuine confidence in your product's ability to help. Radiate confidence during the pitch and while addressing objections and build trust and inspire confidence in the prospects. Obviously, this is massively important in skills. Your confidence is going to be so, so important in terms of how much you convert and how little you convert. I do understand confidence will come with experience. Like if I think back to my first couple of sales calls, I was very nervous. You know, I probably didn't prepare as much as I wanted, but I didn't have all of these resources that I'm giving to you. So you have all of the resources and tools in front of you. Ultimately, confidence will build and build and build as you take more sales calls, as you get more experience, as you get some more closes, as you run a business and grow as an entrepreneur. But you need to do your best to exude genuine confidence from the start. And this is so, so important for your conversions. Patience. Conduct calls patiently and professionally. Respect the prospect's time and allow adequate space for discussions. Rushing can hinder rapport building and successful conversions. Really, really important that you conduct calls slowly, carefully, articulately and patiently. This is really, really important. You don't want to rush prospects. You want to give them time to answer you in the way or form they want to. And you don't want to rush because it's going to hinder rapport building and successful conversations. You want to be slow and your sales calls want to be really, really meticulous. We don't want any room for fluff or we don't want any room for small talk, but we do want to be very, very meticulous and very, very slow about what direction we're going down and what we're asking prospects. So that's what I mean by patience. Work a straight line, maintain focus and stick to your line of questioning. Avoid going off topic for the sake of rapport or adding value. Display professionalism and commitment to the business growth. This is really, really important. And this is a massive one that beginners get wrong. They start going away off topic, away off on a tangent, asking them about this, that and the other, about their local town or this, that and the other, their sports team. This is not good. And it's really, really bad for the direction of the sales call. The direction of your sales call should be all adhered to your script. That's really, really important. You cannot go off topic on your script. Every single question, every single line should be from your script. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean you need to be robotic and literally read off your script, but the entire structure of the sales call should adhere to your script. Because as I've said, there are Going off topic can be bad for rapport building and it can just feel like you're talking a whole load of nonsense, a whole load of fluff and then at the end of the sales call, they don't have any pain points. They don't, you haven't pulled on their emotions and you can't sell them, you can't convert. So that's what I mean by work on a straight line. Empathetic listening, practice active listening and genuinely understand your prospects need. Empathize with their challenges and aspirations to build a strong connection. Tailor your pitch to address their specific pain points and desires. So you need to be a really, really good listener. Being a good listener is a very, very underrated skill and it's massively important on sales calls. You will feel the urge, especially at the start when you've no experience and you're a complete beginner, to jump in and do this, that and the other and you just feel like you want to say something, but you need to listen. I don't mean hear what they're saying. I mean genuinely listen. There's a massive difference between hearing what someone says and listening to what someone says. Huge, huge difference. So become an empathetic listener and really, really harness this skill. Authority positioning. So establish yourself as an authority in your niche or industry. Share success stories, credentials or achievements to build credibility. Convey confidence in your expertise to instill trust in your prospects. So I would actually be of the opinion that this needs to be done before the sales call. It is related to the sales call because it builds credibility. It builds authority and it's going to increase your chances of converting. But send over success stories, send over credentials or achievements before the sales call. 
That's really, really important. Send all of that over before the sales call so they have all of that. So you're not like messing around trying to share your screen. You can do it through a presentation, but I personally wouldn't do it that way. I don't think that's very effective. I don't think that's very impactful. It's kind of kind of like mess up the structure of the call. I would send this over before the call so the client has that and you already have that in your back pocket. You have authority. Harness social proof. Showcase testimonials, case studies, reviews from satisfied clients. Highlight your agency's track record of success to reinforce your credibility. Use social proof to overcome objections and increase your prospect's confidence. So ultimately with social proof, what we're going to try and do with that is prevent any objections. The best objection handling technique is to prevent them in the first place. So how do we do that? We use rapport building. We find their pain points. We pull in their emotions. We use logical selling and we send them social proof. So if we can do that, Usually they shouldn't have any objections if you're doing this correctly, if you're doing this properly. However, if at the end of the sales call they do have some objections, just show them a few case studies, show them a few testimonials that completely contradict what they're saying and show them the results, show them what they're after, show them how John tripled his business and is able to take a few days off per week or whoever, Tim, you know, quadrupled his business, blah, blah, blah. Show them a case study that's going to contradict any of their objections. The power of value. Offer value upfront, such as free resources or advice. Create a sense of value, making prospects more inclined to reciprocate. Demonstrate your commitment to having them succeed beyond the seal. So maybe you have a Facebook ads cheat sheet, or maybe you have the top 10 ways for roofers to improve their marketing or improve sales. And you can give this to the client either on the call, at the start of the call, before the call, after the call, and really, really create a massive amount of perceived value for the client. This is really, really important. The power of value will increase your conversions tenfold. Navigating objections with grace. We're gonna get into this in future lessons and how we can actually navigate objections and like objection handling is a beast in and of itself and we're gonna get into that in great, great detail. But anticipate common rejections and prepare thoughtful responses. Address objections with empathy and provide reassuring solutions and turn objections into opportunities to strengthen your pitch. So what do I mean by that? Like let's say they say, you know, they ask you a question or I've been burned with agencies in the past or I'm not quite ready to move forward. You could say, look, I'm glad you've said that and then go into your objection and use that actually as an asset to create more rapport, to create more authority and show them that you're the real deal. So you can actually turn objections into really, really positive responses and we're going to get into that in later lessons. And then finally, the art of closing. Master various closing techniques, hard sales, soft sales, such as a sums of close or trial closes. Tailor your closing approach to fit the prospect's communication style. Be confident and direct and asking for the sale. Leave no room for uncertainty. So again, we're going to get into this in future lessons, but master the art of closing. Have a lot of feathers in your cap in terms of how you can close a person and become an absolute killer, savage salesperson. I'll see you in the next lesson. Building your answer vault. So in this lesson, we're going to be discussing why you need to build up your answers. You're going to be asked difficult questions on sales calls, especially at the start when you've, you know, you don't, you're not going to have as much experience as you will down the line. And you're not going to be able to answer questions proficiently, articulately and correctly. And um, so we are going to build an answer vault whilst we're doing our sales calls. I'm obviously going to give you a lot of ammunition. I'm going to give you a lot of answers. I'm going to give you a lot of teachings and future lessons on what to say in these scenarios. But it is a really, really good rule of thumb to build your answer vault while you are doing the sales call. So that's going to do it. After presenting your offer, allow prospects to ask questions. Answer questions concisely and confidently emphasizing benefits. Develop a vault of repeatable answers for common prospect queries. So on sales calls, throughout the call and particularly at the end of the call when you're handling objections, you're going to get asked questions and you're going to get asked tough questions. So you need to write all of these questions down and create an answer vault, create a rinse and repeat, really, really high quality answers for all of the questions. And I'm going to tell you how you're going to develop them in future lessons. I'm going to give you some answers, but you need to start developing this answer vault early because it's going to be really, really valuable. and It's going to be an asset to you as a business. Be concise and on point. Avoid tangents or unrelated information. Stick to the core of their question for clarity. There's nothing worse than when you're on a call with someone and they're rambling and they're giving you a load of fluff and you're just like, what is this person talking about? Be concise and on point. Do not go off on crazy tangents as you're gonna lose interest from the prospect. Answer with confidence. Begin with positive affirmations like awesome question or great question. Exude confidence in your response to build trust. So if someone asks you a question like how many clients are you currently working with or what's the best results you've got in the past, hit them with some positivity first. Really glad you asked that, John. Great question. I can't wait to get into it. So, and then get into the answer. Really, really positive. Exudes confidence and puts it back on them. You know, I'm actually really happy you, glad you answered that question because remember, when they ask you a question, 
that is giving you an opportunity to build rapport. That is giving you an opportunity to build authority and really knock it out of the park with your answer. So remember that. Avoid vagueness. Strike a balance between providing details and staying focused. Don't get lost in the moment, but offer enough information to satisfy their curiosity. So this is going back to the previous point. They're quite similar. Do not waffle. Do not hit them with a load of fluff. Avoid vagueness. Be super concise and strike a balance between super detail oriented and staying focused. After answering, listen, allow prospects to process the response, be attentive to their reactions and readiness to continue. So we touched on this in previous lessons. Listening is such a slept on skill and it's so, so important. You will not believe what people will tell you if you simply sit there and listen. So bear that in mind when you're on sales calls, put huge, huge emphasis on being a really, really good listener, a high quality listener, because you won't believe what prospects will tell you. Understanding prospect intentions. Realize the questions are either confirmations of buying decisions or potential doubts. Preemptively address questions to reinforce confidence. So this will go, we'll go into this in the objection handling lesson, but the best way that you can answer someone's question or the, the best answer to someone's negative question or a doubtful question or asking you a question, maybe trying to catch you out, is to avoid that question in the first place. And how do we do that? We build rapport, we build authority, we dig into their pain points and we try and cover everything on sales call to avoid any tough questions, to avoid any tricky questions in the first place. Example, do you use Facebook ads or how do you use Facebook ads or explain Facebook ads to me? This is a common question because a lot of the prospects you might be speaking to maybe haven't used Facebook ads before. So they're going to ask you a lot of questions around how do Facebook ads work? You know, what are you doing day to day? And, you know, can you tell me a little bit of how the process works? How you could answer that is, that's actually a really good question. We've extensively tested various advertising methods and consistently found that Facebook ads deliver the best profitability for our clients. We've honed our expertise in this area and achieved remarkable results. Many businesses have faced challenges with Facebook ads, but we've mastered the art of making them work for reals. So that's how it works and that's how it's going to benefit you and your business. So there you go. That is a great answer if they ask you a tricky question around Facebook ads and you should have that in your answer vault. You can take that one. I don't care. Take that answer, put it in your answer vault. And when anyone asks you a tricky question around Facebook ads, you hit them with that answer and that will really impress them and bring across that you're an authority and expert in your area. Loop every answer back to how it helps the prospect achieve their outcome. Answers should build confidence, not doubt. So what do I mean by that? Also, I've highlighted looping because looping is a sales strategy you will hear me talk about in future lessons and in previous lessons. Looping is really, really important in sales. We'll get into that a little bit later. But what do I mean by this? Reiterate. Loop every answer back to how it helps the prospect achieve their outcome. It should always be pulling on the prospect's pain points, pulling on the prospect's heartstrings. What have we talked about previous in the call? Have we got their pain points? And have we used that as ammunition when they ask us tricky questions? That's what I mean by that. Answers should build confidence, not doubt. If you are answering in a really nervous way where you haven't got a pre-prepared answer or you're just all over the place, it's going to build doubt and they're not going to want to partner with you for their marketing. They're not going to have confidence in you. So that's what I mean. Answers should build confidence, not doubt. Objection handling fundamentals, super, super important for sales. And this is going to be a really, really exciting lesson for anyone that doesn't have sales experience. If you do have some sales experience, you will know some of the key terms and some of the teachings here. But I'd say a lot of the people coming into this program and doing this lesson and starting their agency do not have sales experience. And that's where lessons like this really, really technical training on how to handle objections with potential prospects on calls is going to be super valuable. So let's get into it. Key terms. So if you have no sales experience, these are going to be a little bit bizarre. They're going to be a little bit alien to you. If you do have sales experience, you will have seen all these before. Essentially, what we're talking about here is smoke screens, diffusing, reframing, isolating and looping. So what do I mean when I say smoke screen? Smoke screen essentially means when someone is giving you an objection, but it's BS. They don't actually mean that. They're just saying that to get off the call. So what do I mean by that? So you'll find an SMA or a lot of your agency calls, you will get a financial objection. They'll say, oh, I can't afford your services. A little bit expensive for us right now or whatever they're going to say. That is simply BS because they want to get off the call. And what, what do people say when they want to get out of a situation? Oh, I can't afford it or I have no money. When in reality, they're actually skeptical. They're fearful. They've had a 
a negative experience with an agency in the past or you just haven't sold them they're not convinced on you um, on the sales call you haven't built enough rapport you haven't built enough authority so they're going to give you a smokescreen objection to get off that call and you need to really analyze that nicely at that we're going to get into that later you want to diffuse the situation so once they give you that objection you want to completely diffuse the situation you want to come down to their level and you want to take all the steam and intensity out of the conversation and really just diffuse everything and bring down the situation then you want to reframe you want to reframe their mindset you want to reframe the way they think because currently they think a certain way and that's why they don't want to go with you that's why they're they're saying what they're saying that's why they're giving you the isolation that they're giving you their mindset is currently in a certain place and you need to take it out of that place and get it where you want in order to close them you have isolating so again this is very very related to smoke screen and diffusing and reframing you actually want to isolate what objection they're giving you because if they're giving you a smoke screen objection you need to find out what their actual problem is so they're giving you a smoke screen financial objection then you need to isolate that and find out okay is it a partner objection is it a time objection we're going to get into the types of objection the types of objections in a second but you need to isolate that and find out what the actual objection is and then looping looping is what we do when we're reframing and we loop around and round and around and show that the the prospect is actually contradicting themselves and what they're saying and that how our service and working with us is going to be the best thing going forward for them so that is the key terms just so you're aware as we go forward in the lesson objection types so with smma there are four main objection types there are financial objections there are fear objections time objections and partner objections they're all pretty self-explanatory but i'll go into a little bit of detail on each now financial objection is the most simple one it simply means they cannot afford their your services this shouldn't come up too much because what I'm going to teach you, they shouldn't be on the call with you if they can't afford their services. You will have a calumny form that qualifies them. So they should not be on the call unless they have funds. Plus, any business that can't afford a few, a couple of grand to do marketing shouldn't be on a call with you. Like for a business that is not a lot of money, they should be able to invest that in marketing, especially at the start when you're going to be pricing your services pretty keenly, probably a lot smaller or a lot lower than what they're going to be priced down the line. So this shouldn't really come up much. The next one, fear objection, is going to be the most common one. It's going to allow for probably 80, 90% of your objections. And again, that simply means that they are not convinced you can do what you're telling them you're going to do. They're not convinced by you. You haven't built enough rapport. You haven't built enough authority. They've possibly been burnt by an agency in the past. That's very, very popular because there's so many agencies out there right now that don't know what they're doing. So they will have their guard up and they will be super, super skeptical. And it might take you a while to find out that that's actually the problem. They might give you time objections, financial objections, but really behind all of that is fear objections. And I'm going to show you how you isolate that and really find out what their objection is. But know that fear objections is going to probably be 80 percent of your objections people are going to be super super skeptical then we have a time objection so you know maybe it's coming up to christmas or maybe they're going on vacation they're going to say to you look now isn't the best time can we catch up in a month can we catch up in two months I'm going to teach you how you deal with those objections, but that is another objection that possibly will come up. Then you have the partner objection. So they might have a business partner. They might have a wife that they need to you know, run everything past. And that is something that's come up. You know, they might say something like, oh, I need to speak to my wife or I need to speak to my business partner. I can't make a decision right now. So again, we can get around that by asking questions on our form or by asking questions in the DMs or email or whoever or however you're booking this call. Like, are you the key decision maker? Can you make a decision on this call? We can get around that so the partner objection doesn't come up that often. However, no, these are the four main objection types you're going to have on your sales calls. So this is the process. So once we drop our offer and we ask them what they think, you're actually not going to ask them what they think. You're just going to drop the offer and go silent. But if you don't close them, they're going to give you an objection. And nine times out of ten, it's going to be a smokescreen objection. They're not going to give you an authentic objection because... For one reason or another, people just say what they think they have to say to get off a sales call. So they're not going to give you the, the real objection. So know that. They're going to give you a smokescreen objection. Now, a smokescreen objection can take any form, but all a smokescreen objection means is they are telling you something that isn't true. So they're telling you that they need to think about it. They're telling you that they... I haven't got time they're telling you that they can't afford you they're telling you that they need to think of a wife they need to speak to their wife they might even have a wife they're just telling you something that they think will get them off the call so what do you do in that instance you do what's called diffusing so you completely diffuse the situation we're going to go into a bit of detail on how to do that now in a second but you come down to their level and you say john i completely understand what you're saying i do not want you to make a decision you're not comfortable with or however you're going to say it you need to completely diffuse the situation 
then we're going to go into how to isolate the objection. So they've just given us a financial objection. I'm going to show you how to isolate that and actually find out is it a fear objection, is it a time objection, is it a partner objection, and really get to the bottom on the crux of what's actually holding them back. So that's really, really important. And then we're going to go into reframing. So we want to reframe their mindset. As I said earlier, their mind is in a certain place and we want to get it from X to Y. X is not going to close. Y is going to close. So how do we get it from X to Y? We reframe their mindset and we use some sales psychology and we use some really, really impactful language that I'm going to teach you now in a second in order to reframe them. And then if the reframe doesn't work, we do what's called looping. And looping and reframing, they're interconnected. So you loop by reframing, but looping is a sales technique where you loop around and around and around. And eventually, if you loop enough times, the prospect will have no choice to say yes because you're just plainly showing them that what they're saying does not make sense. You're psychologically reframing them and showing them that, look, what you're saying does not make sense. If you want to get your business to where you told me you want to get it to, what you're saying makes absolutely no sense. You need to work with us. You know that marketing is the way to take your business forward. And then we're going to get into a lot more detail about how all of that works. But the sales objection handling process is exactly this. It's a five-part process, smokescreen, diffuse, isolate, reframe, and loop. So write this down, really, really important to make sure you learn what these terms mean because I'm going to be talking about them a lot in this lesson and in future lessons. So let's get into more of the details. So smokescreen objections, what form can they take? I need to have a think about things, you know, wishy-washy, what does that actually mean? You know, that just means they're not convinced. They're giving you a smokescreen objection. You know, what do they need to think about? You're right in front of them now. If they need to think about th something, ask you. You're the person that they need to ask, you know, have a think about things right now. You know, I'm not sure can we, we can afford you right now. I've highlighted that because that's the one we're going to use and um, going forward to show you how the process actually works in real time. I need to speak to my wife. Very, very common. You know, these sort of old boomer business owners, they have wives. Their wives are usually partners in the business. They've got to speak to their wives before making any big financial decisions. Very, very common. Not the best time for us right now. So again, something that comes up very, very regularly, but it just means that they're just bullshitting you. That, that, that does not mean it's not, they're on the call for a reason. So when they say it's not the best time for us right now, that just means you haven't convinced them that you're the right person to run their marketing. So diffusing, what can you say if someone says, you know, I'm not sure we can afford you right now. We want to completely diffuse the situation. So I've given three examples here. First one, I completely understand, John, times can be tough and this has to be the right fit for both of us. So completely bringing it down to his level, telling him you understand is really, really important. So the next one, I absolutely see where you're coming from, John. You need to be very smart with where you allocate your capital. So you're coming across to his side of the table. You appreciate this as a big decision for his business. And you're saying you understand. You're actually saying, you know, he needs to be very smart with where he allocates his capital. So that's going to be really, really good. And it's going to build some rapport for him as well. And the last one, I'm with you 100%, John. The next move for your business is super important. And I don't want you doing something you're not comfortable with. So again, coming around to his side of the table saying, hey, John, look, I completely understand. And I don't want you doing anything you're not comfortable with. Really, really good, and it's gonna build a lot of authority, it's gonna build a lot of rapport with the potential prospect. So that is diffusing. Let's get into isolating. So the first thing you're gonna say is, you're telling me the only reason you're not moving forward is a money issue, is that correct? So remember, we're doing this example, not sure we can afford you right now. So you're gonna isolate now, you're saying, so you're telling me, John, the only reason you're not moving forward is a money issue, is that correct? And then he's gonna say yes. So let's put the money issue to one side. Let's say money wasn't a problem and you had a stack of cash in your room. Would working together be of interest to you? You know, if money was no issue at all. And this is where it's going to be really, really important. If he says yes, then it's genuinely a money issue. But again, he should not be on that call with you if it is a money issue. You're going to qualify him in the DMs. You're going to qualify him via email and you're going to have a colony form. So he should not be on that call if he's not financially qualified. So this will rarely happen where he genuinely is in financial difficulty and can't afford you. However, if he then says no, we know it's a fear objection. So if you said to him, look, if you had all the money in the world, would you be interested in working together? And he'll say something like, well, actually, you know, I'm not sure or wishy-washy. And then you'll get around to, well, actually, we worked with an agency before and they were terrible. So how do we get him to say that? We say, look, I just go say, John, is there something you're not telling me here? Because I feel like we have a great rapport. I feel like we would work really, really well together. I'm getting the impression that it's not a financial thing. Is there something I'm missing here? And then he will say, well, actually, we worked with an agency before and they were terrible. 
boom, we've just isolated the objection and we found out what the real reason is. We now know it's a fear objection, not a financial or a price objection. Really, really important. And that's how we isolate. So what do you say once John actually tells you it's a fear objection? And that's like a little quick win. That's a win for you when you find out that because then you're growing as a salesman. Then you're growing as an entrepreneur. You're growing as an agency owner because you've just learned how to isolate an objection. And just purely isolating objections is going to increase your close rate by 10, 20, 30 percent. So you're doing really, really well if you get to this point, and it should be a little exciting point on the call. So what you're going to say is, I completely understand your perspective, John. No one wants to put their trust in someone and pay that much money not to be giving the service they were promised. It's really unfortunate, and I'm really, really sorry that's happened to you. Again, actually a little bit of diffusing there as well. You're coming down to his level, and then you're going to say something like, do you mind if I share my perspective? And of course, John is going to say, yes, go ahead. And then we're going to go into reframing and looping. And I'm going to use a Google Doc for this because it's quite detailed and it just lends itself to a Google Doc. So we're going to get in that now in a second. So here we are in the Google Doc of the fear-based objections, specifically burnt in the past. And we can see here the last message on the Google Doc. I completely understand your perspective. No one wants to put their trust in someone and pay that much money and then not be given the service they were promised. That's unfortunate and I'm sorry that's happened to you. So this document is going to be absolute gold. I'm going to attach it to this lesson. And literally you can use this on every sales call because it's probably going to go very similar to this. And we're going to go through how we can reframe and how we can loop. And we're going to go through, I think, three or four different loops. And the top sales guys, the top killer savage closers can loop and loop and loop until the cows come home and really, really make it very clear to the prospect that their thought or their line of thinking is just wrong and that this, uh, our agency, our program or whatever it may be is the right one for them. So let's get into it. So then you're going to say, do you mind if I share my perspective? And the prospect is going to say yes. And then you're going to say, so you've been burned in the past and are apprehensive about giving your hard earned money away to get burned again. So there's a trust issue when it comes to investing in marketing. Would you agree? Then they're going to say yes. And you're going to say, however, ultimately to get to where you want to get in business, you're going to have to put your trust in someone. And we agreed earlier that this is in marketing, right? He's going to say yes. So if you shut yourself off and never trusted anyone ever again because of your past experience, do you agree this would be counterproductive and stop you ultimately achieving your business's full potential? So again, crucial, crucial line there. If you shut yourself off and never trusted anyone ever again because of your past experience, do you agree this would be counterproductive and stop you from ultimately achieving your potential in business? Really, really great line. And that's going to be a get him thinking like, yeah, I got to trust someone at some stage. So if we scroll down, he's going to say yes. And you're obviously very interested in marketing or else you wouldn't be on this call. I understand you can't trust everything we say, but I've just shown you my past case studies and in-depth run through of our process. And I also think we've got built up a pretty good rapport on this call. There's not much else I can show you. So there does come a stage where you have to take an element of risk and put your trust in someone, hopefully us. Wouldn't you agree? And he's going to say yes. And then you're going to say, so we're in agreement on all of that. So what do you think is the best decision? This is an absolutely killer line. What do you think is the best decision? So when you go to bed tonight, you can say, or you can look yourself in the mirror and say, you've done everything in your power to get your business one step closer to its goals. Positive response, okay, where do you want to go from here? And then you go for the close. So what we've just done there is completely reframed his mindset using some sales psychology and also just using some logic. Like he does have to trust someone at some stage in order to get his business to where he wants to get because he wouldn't be on the call if he didn't see the value in marketing. Marketing is how businesses grow. So that's, most people are going to be pretty reasonable about that. That's how they're going to grow their business, using marketing. So he wouldn't be on this call. So when you reframe using that sales psychology and using that logic, it's going to make complete sense to him. And a lot of the time, this one loop and this one reframe is going to work. However, let's say at, you get to the end, he's like, oh, you know, still blah, blah, blah. It's a lot of risk for my business. We're going to go into loop two. If you still haven't got him on the hook, we're going to go into loop two if he says, oh, it's just too risky. It's just too risky. I can't do it at this one time. Okay, you're going to say, okay. Okay, John, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? How important is it to you that you reach your desired goal? And this goes back to the pain points and the sales call structure and the sales call format in terms of finding his pain points at the start of the call. Really, really important. So he might say to you at the start of the call, I'm sick working, you know, 60, 70 hours a week. I want to take a Friday off. I want to take my family to Disney World or blah, blah, blah. You will need to have had his pain points in your locker as ammunition, as an asset to do this. 
So you're going to say, how important is it to you that you reach your desired goal? And he's going to say, you know, it's really important. You know, I really want to do it. That's why I'm in business. I want to, I want to reach these goals. And you're going to say, why? You're going to dig into it. Yeah, but tell me why. Like specifically why. He's then going to come back with more detail. And then you're going to say, how much longer are you willing to put it off? And then he's going to say something like, no, not long. You know, as I told you, I'm really committed to this. I really want to do this. I really want to grow my business. And then you're going to say, what do you think is riskier? Putting your business in a position every single day that gets you closer to your goals or not doing anything. And in the next three years, being in the exact same position or even worse off than you are now. Which one do you think is riskier? And he's going to say, well, okay, that kind of makes sense. You know, if I keep doing what I'm doing, which is clearly not working, you know, I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to do anything. So I guess what you're saying kind of makes sense. You know, taking action is what makes sense here. Boom. Reframe loop number two, go in for the close. Okay, where do you want to go from here, John? And that is our second loop. And you can see here how this can be really, really powerful. Like this is gold. Like this is not only going to be good for your agency, this is going to be good for life. Like if you learn how to reframe people's mindsets and get them thinking to where you want to think. As we said earlier, they're currently in X and you want to get them to Y. So how do we get their mindset from X to Y? And you can see here, like it's it's logical, it's sales psychology, but it is excellent, excellent stuff. Like it is really, really good. And this will work like a treat on your calls. So let's say he's still not convinced. You know, he said, you know, I do agree with what you're saying, but... I just don't know if it's worth it. I just don't know if it's worth it, worth working with you. you maybe got a bit of imposter syndrome myself. I don't know if I can make all of this work. And then you're going to say something like this. Let me ask you this. So we've discussed, we have the exact strategy to get you to where you want to be in front of you. Yeah, you agree? You think the strategy would work and you, you think it all sounds good. And he's like, yeah, it sounds good. It sounds good. So right now, with the current decision-making process, you're validating where you are right now. Does that make sense? And what I mean by that when I say something like that is, all of his decisions have got him up until where he is now, which means all of his decisions have led him to being unhappy with his progress, unhappy with his business, unhappy with his KPIs. And then you're going to say, unless you overcome and break through that, you're going to stay exactly where you are. You're going to make absolutely no progress. Does that make sense? And then he's going to say, yeah, that actually does make a lot of sense. And then you're going to say, in life, when you're faced with a big decision, you can either validate that you deserve where you're currently at, or you can push through and build the life of your dreams using your business as your cash flow vehicle. Because that's what it is. This decision will change your life. And then you can say something like, I'm not being dramatic, John. You know, what do I mean by that? All of the decisions you've made in your life up until this point have got you to where you are. Unhappy with your business, unfulfilled, overworked, underpaid. That's where your current decision making process has got you to. Now, are you willing to make a different decision to break through that mold, to get you away from that process, to get a different result, ultimately to grow your business and change your life. Are you willing to do that? And he'll say, wow, I've never thought about it like that. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. And then you're going to go in with, you can have that life you want if you're able to overcome that mindset shift, if you can make that paradigm shift, if you can just trust in someone to get you to your desired result. I know I'm the right person to get you there. You just have to put your trust in me. That's all I'm asking. Just put your trust in me and I will do the rest. And then go in for the close if you have convinced him. But if you haven't convinced him, which might happen, like some, like the top closers, the killer closers can loop and loop and loop because the prospect keeps giving them excuses, keeps giving them excuses. So here's loop number four. And let's say John says, look Dylan, I really like you. I really like what you're saying. I really like your business. I really like your process. I think it all sounds fantastic, but I simply need time to think about this. I simply need time to think about this. I can't make a decision on the spot. I'm really, really sorry, but I understand what you're saying and I understand like what I'm saying kind of is contradicting myself and illogical, but I need, I simply need time to think. So you're going to go back and you're going to say, look, John, I get it. I get it. But look, can I ask you this? When you say you need time to think, what do you actually mean by that? And he'll say, well, you know, I just need time to think if this is the right thing or if financially we can do this or I, I just need to think. And you're going to say, I see. Just for the sake of clarity, would you be open to hearing my perspective on, you know, having time to think? And he's going to say, yeah, go ahead. And you're going to say, okay, cool. So based on what we've discussed, are you happy in your current situation? Would you say you're reaching your full potential? You might need to ask if this is your fourth loop and it's already very, very apparent he is unhappy in his current situation. So if this is like 
obviously you might get I need time to think on like loop two or loop one before you've asked that question. So you might necessarily need to ask it here, but I've just put it in there in case it's like the first or second loop. And then he's going to answer. And then you're going to say, so would you say the decisions we make in life impacts the outcome we experience? And also how we make those decisions. And he's going to say yes. And then you're going to say, so given what we've just discussed, you're not happy with where you're at. Are you willing to let the same decision making process dictate the results and outcomes you'd receive moving forward to likely produce more of the same? So again, very, very similar to the last loop in that he said, you know, validation. I don't know if this is worth doing or blah, blah, blah. You're going to go back to changing the paradigm shift, changing the mindset. So he's going to say no. And then you're going to say why? And he's going to say, you know, if I want to get to where I want to get, I'm going to have to start making some different decisions and blah, blah, blah. And then you're going to say, so how much longer are you going to let those decisions making patterns? How much longer are you going to let those decision making patterns prevent you from reaching your full potential? How much longer? Because I know you're really committed to this. I know you really want to do this. How much longer are you willing to let those decision making patterns make you sit on the sidelines? And then he's going to give you this whole big spiel about how important it is. And then you're going to say, so what do you think right now to break through those patterns and start yielding better outcomes? What do you need to do right now to do that? And then hopefully he's going to say, you know, trust in your marketing or go with you. I think this is the right way to go forward. Okay, so let's say it's still negative. You're going to say something like, look, at some stage, you're going to have to break the mold. Up until this point, you've made the decision that someone in your position makes. If you want to break through the upper echelon and start making serious money, you're going to have to make tough decisions. And that's what this is, John. This is a very tough decision. Human nature dictates that we back away from tough decisions. We know this is a risk. We know you have to put your trust in me. We know you've been burnt in the past. But we've just discussed that the best thing for you to do is put your trust in someone, drive your business forward through marketing. Because we know that's how we're going to get your business to the next level. So it is a tough decision and you're going to tell yourself a thousand reasons to not do it because that's more comfortable. To not do it is more comfortable. To keep doing what you're doing is more comfortable. So we need to break through that mold and we need to make a really, really tough decision. And that's what we're talking about here. Does that make sense, John? And he's going to give you an answer. And then you're going to say the really, really key line. What decision can you make right here, right now to put yourself in the best position to reach your goals six months from now? I'm indifferent here. I'm running my business, John. And we're talking here about your business and you clearly need help. So what can you do right here, right now, that when you go to bed tonight, that you look yourself in the mirror tonight, you can say, John, I made the best decision today to get me one step closer to my goal. What can we do right now, John? Tell me, what can we do right now? Because this is really, really important. This is your business. This is your life. This is your family. What can we do right here, right now, that's going to get you one step closer to your goal? And then he's going to give you an answer. And um, my God, if you've done four loops and you've hit him with that passion, you've hit him with that intensity, you've hit him with that seal psychology, you've hit him with all this logic. If he still says no, you're going to book him on another call. That's very, very worst case scenario. You're going to book him on another call because that means he's still, there's still potential. There. You're going to book him on a call for next week or you're going to go like, let him have a think about it because there's just no getting through to him. He's just a brick wall. But if you do this, your close rate will 10x. If you follow exactly what we just discussed in this lesson, because a lot of your objections will be fear. They'll, this will go carbon copy exactly like this because they'll be super skeptical. They'll maybe not be convinced by you. They're not convinced by the industry. They're not convinced by who they've been burnt in the past with. So it will be very, very similar to this. And if you can follow this process, if you can watch this lesson, if you can really, really learn this in depth, you will absolutely kill it with objections. So really, really important. Hope you enjoyed that lesson. This is super valuable, really, really gold. I didn't learn this till a fair bit into my agency journey. Like I didn't even know objection handling had a science to it. I didn't know there was loads of key terms like looping, isolating, diffusing, reframing. If I had have known, my God, I don't know where my agency would be today. It would probably two, three, four X my results. So this is really, really gold stuff. This is crucial learn all of this we're going to get into how we can answer certain difficult questions and more objections in future lessons we're going to get into the price objection in more detail um, and all of that good stuff so really really crucial lesson watch this over and over and over again i'm going to link this document below so you can save it and have it for yourself but this is really really good stuff i want you to learn this as much as possible hope you enjoyed that one and i'll see you in the next lesson 
In this lesson, we're going to be looking at our response fault. I'm going to give you proven and tested answers that you can say in difficult situations when potential prospects hit you with difficult questions. So let's get straight into it. So I need to talk to my wife, business partner, about this. Prevention. Make sure all relevant decision makers are on the call and clarify this before the call begins. Again, we've discussed this in previous lessons. You need to make sure the key decision maker is on the call. You can do this by adding questions to your Calendly form. You can do this by asking them specific questions, whether it's in the DMs, whether it's via email or on a cold call or however you book them. However, you need to make sure all decision makers are on the call to avoid this question or to avoid this objection. So the rebuttal for this smokescreen, I totally understand, John. Let me ask you this. It is the case that you're totally on board with doing this and just want to get it signed off or are you having some doubts elsewhere? If no doubts, continue to rebuttal too. If they are having doubts, pivot to a fear-based objection with which we discussed in a previous lesson. So rebuttal for a genuine objection. I totally understand that, John, and I'm with you all the way. I wouldn't dream of making a decision without my business partner signing off first. I'm happy for you to chat through it with him, her, but to hold that incentive-based pricing, I need some sort of a small commitment from you. Would you be happy to pay a refundable deposit of $250 on the promise that we schedule up a follow-up call on your business with your business partner? And if the outcome of that is negative, I'll refund you the money. Notes. If they aren't willing to put a deposit down, they're probably never likely to ever buy. So this deposit is just a little psychological thing. If they are willing to financially commit to this, then you know they are so much more likely to close down the line. However, if they aren't willing to put down a totally refundable deposit to lock in their place, you know they're a bit wishy-washy. You know they're not maybe as solid as you thought and you know this is all a smokescreen just to get off the call because if the deposit of $250 is totally refundable, then they have literally nothing to lose. And you can say, look, if you're a little bit nervous or apprehensive of putting down a deposit, the only reason I'm getting you to do that is because you are so much more likely to take action. You're so much more likely to do what we discussed and we're so much more likely to work together and get you to your desired result if you just financially commit to this. Just a little bit if you just financially commit to this. You're so much more likely and try and reframe his mindset because he's going to be like, no, 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 I don't want to give a deposit. I don't want to give this guy any money. You know, I'm going to get my money back, blah, blah, blah. So you got to reframe his mindset and show him like it's the only reason we're doing this is to get you committed to this. Are you actually committed to doing this, John? And you'll know if he's not willing to put down a totally refundable deposit, then he's going to be a little bit flaky. Can I speak with some of your clients' references? Prevention, send all testimonials prior to the call. So send up an SOP, set up an operation where they get the testimonials via email. Maybe you can set it up on Calendly that they automatically get sent their emails. Or maybe you have a confirmation page with all of your case studies like I do. However, if you haven't done that and they hit you with this objection, and your rebuttal could be, great question, and I fully understand why you've asked that. While I respect the request, we don't give out client information purely because of the nature of digital marketing. If our competitors knew where to look, they could copy all of our strategies. With that being said, I don't want you to have any doubt coming into this, so I'm really hoping you can share my confidence. This is also why we have a guarantee. We're mega confident we can get you what you want, and I want you to feel as comfortable as possible with this decision. So... There you hit him with a really, really good answer and you can even go into more detail. Look, you can say, look, my client's revenue on Facebook ads, it, it allows for 80% of their revenue. Now, if it, you were in their shoes, would you like someone looking behind the curtain and looking at your revenue and looking at how much money you're making from ads and what copy and ads you're using? You just wouldn't feel comfortable to it. It actually would be unprofessional for me to do that. So I hope you can understand and go into a little bit more detail on why you can't do that. But essentially, that is what we're going to say in that circumstance. Rebuttal number two. Awesome question. I'm so glad you asked that. I want you to be as confident as possible coming into this. And we actually do a ton of these calls every single week. And we get that request a lot, as you can imagine. And since we don't want to bother our beloved current clients with these requests, we built up a web page dedicated solely to testimonials. There's tons and tons on there. If you want, I'll go make a quick coffee while you have a look through. Send them the link to your landing page where you can have your testimonials on there. Let them have a look through. And this should really put their mind at ease. And this is another really, really good way to get this done. You can set up a cheap landing page and put your testimonials on there pretty easily. What's your guarantee? So this isn't really an objection. It's more of a question which will turn into an objection if not handled correctly. The strength of your guarantee depends on two things, the actual content of it and the way you deliver it. So what you could say was, ah, my favorite question of all. So basically, the first thing we can guarantee is that you don't work with us or make a change to fix this, you're going to stay stuck with this problem forever. So that's the first thing. However, we also do guarantee that, and then just go ahead and state your guarantee as clearly and as concisely as possible, so there's nothing left um, confused by the client, so you can clearly, clearly state exactly what your guarantee is. If they ask for a guarantee before asking for a price, say sure. 
well, the guarantee only really makes sense once you actually understand the investment, if you get me, and then they'll say, I see, well, what is that exactly? And then pitch the price and then the guarantee afterwards. The guarantee should always come after the price. I don't make decisions on the spot. Prevention, use incentive-based pricing. So if you have preyed on performance pricing, it's gonna be very, very difficult to say no. And this goes back to the offer lesson. If your offer is absolutely out of this world, they will never say I don't make decisions on the spot because they can't say no. It goes back to Alex Hermosi. If your offer is good enough, make it so, so good that they cannot say no. However, if it's a genuine objection, your rebuttal is going to be, John, I'm totally on board with that and I completely understand where you're coming from here. In fact, I admire that. With that said, this doesn't feel like an on-the-spot decision for me. I could understand if we've been talking for a few minutes, but we've just spent 45 minutes to an hour exploring everything about your business and your key problems. And we've come to the conclusion that this is exactly what you need to move forward. From my perspective, we are the perfect fit for you. And it's not really about pulling the trigger. It's about sharing the confidence that I have that we can do this. Does that make sense, John? Killer, killer answer here. Really, really good answer to someone who's saying, you know, I don't make decisions on the spot. You know, they're not making a decision on the spot. You haven't just hit them with a 30 second pitch. You've been talking for an hour going through everything in real, real detail. So that's a really, really good answer. Rebuttal for the smokescreen. I'm with you all the way. And in my experience, the only reason someone doesn't buy on these calls is because they are lacking confidence or information. So tell me, what do you need to move forward now? And I'll do my job to give it to you. So this goes back to, you know, a lot of the time this could be a smokescreen and like logically thinking, if they are saying something like this, I don't make decisions on the spot. You know, they're saying, I need to think about it. I need to think about that. So what do you need to think about? The person that needs to be in front of you when you're thinking about it is here right now. I'm the person that can answer all your questions. So if you don't have confidence or you don't have information, I'm here right in front of you now. Ask me anything you need in order for me to give you that information and give you that confidence. So another really, really good answer. Can I have some time to think about it? This is not an actual objection. It's always a smoke screen. This is always a BS smoke screen objection. And the first rebuttal you're gonna say is, sure, well, let me go make a call for you. I'll give you a few minutes to think about it and then we'll discuss what's on your mind. Is that okay? Or I totally understand why you've asked that. Let me ask, what specifically are you having doubts about, John? So these are really, really two great questions to set up the reframe or to actually genuinely let him have a think about what questions he wants to ask you. I can't afford it. I don't have the money. If they genuinely can't afford it, then let them go. But I can guarantee you that most people will be able to afford it just fine. Exactly. So look, if they're on the call, they can't afford it, essentially. They're not booking a call with a marketing agency or with a marketing expert going into it with very little funds. They have the funds. Most businesses can afford a few grand a month to put that into marketing. This is a very, very, this is always going to be a smoke dream. And a rebuttal you can hit them with is, I see, isn't that why you booked this call in the first place? So yeah, awesome. You know, what were you expecting when you hopped on this call? Were you expecting there to be an investment? Were you expecting, um, you know, what were you expecting? Pay on results or, you know, sort of ask them, what were they expecting when they hopped on the call? Rebuttal number two, I understand, well, is this something you really want to do or not? So this goes back to really actually understanding, are they committed to this? Is this something that they really, really want to do? And you will use their pain points as ammunition that you will have found earlier in your call using the sales call structure that we discussed in previous lessons. And you'll use it as ammunition, but are they actually committed to this? And then you're gonna say, I'm with you all the way. The last thing I want is for money to be the thing that stands in the way of you getting what you want. It takes money to make money and it's like the chicken and the egg thing. What comes first, you know? So how can we make this fair for everyone and make this happen for you? Really, really good question. Diffusing the situation, coming down, understanding their side, coming around their side of the table and hitting them with some logic. Let me build up some cash and then I'll come back to work with you. Rebuttal. Okay, tell me how that would work and let them explain what they're kind of thinking. You know, maybe we're going to borrow some money or I'm going to do this or whatever. Okay. So let me see if I've got this right. What you're saying is that you're going to keep doing what you're already doing, which is hardly building your business and getting basically no results and isn't even paying you enough to live comfortably. And you're going to keep doing that until someday you build up a surplus of cash to invest in what will really work. Is that fair to say? Is that an accurate statement? Then, well, yeah, I guess that doesn't make much sense. Of course it doesn't make any sense because the reason they're on this call is because they're not making as much money as possible. So it makes absolutely no sense for them to go and build up some cash because you're going to be their cash generating machine. You're going to be their lead machine, their sales machine. That's why they're on this call. That's what you're here to do. And then you're gonna say, so how do we make this happen? Now isn't the right time. So a time objection, your rebuttal could be sure. I'm with you, timing is everything. Mind if I ask you a question about that? When will it be the right time for you to get serious about growing this business and start getting what you really want? And that's a really, really good question because Sometimes they hide behind this, you know, now isn't the right time, but when is going to be the right time? There's never a perfect time to grow your business. There's never a perfect time to, to start your marketing campaigns or whatever it may be. So start now. The best time is now. 
or your second or butler could be, I can promise you that doing this and working with us is synonymous with getting you what you want out of this business. Are you saying that now isn't the right time to really get what we talked about in this call? Go back to their pain points, you know, grow your business, double your revenue, take your family to Disney World, take days off work, you know, go back to their pain points and say, you know, when is the right time to do that? When is the right time? Because I can tell you from personal experience, the best time is right now. I've tried marketing agencies before and fail with them. So really, really common one on something that's going to come up a lot. Your response could be, I totally understand. I've been burned before by vendors and it always leaves a sour taste in my mouth. However, the last thing we want is for your past to prevent you from getting the future you want. That's exactly why I started Insert Your Agency Name. I want to be the guy that fixes this for you and rekindles your relationship with the marketing world. If you don't mind me asking, what's specifically happening with these agencies that led you to not getting the results you wanted? So really, really good question. And again, we touched on this in a previous lesson in objection handling fundamentals in great, great detail. This is a very, very common fear-based objection. And go and watch that previous lesson to look for a more detailed response on that. I've got calls with other agencies lined up. So this is quite common also. I'm with you. It's good to keep your options open, but it's even better to close the one that's right for you. And from my position, I can tell you it's this one. I'm certain this is what you need to move forward, and I'm even more certain you won't find a better fit out there. Let me ask you, when did you plan on weighing up your options and making your final decision? They'll always say something like a week or a few days, blah, blah, blah. And then you're going to say next week, next week, we could already have your ads live with new customers walking through your doors. Let me ask you this. Why delay getting what you want for a week only to find out that this was the best option for you in the first place? And a note, if you want someone to second guess their decision, just repeat what they said as if it's the most ludicrous thing you've ever heard in your life. Use this wisely and in a humorous way. Don't offend them. So when he says next week, just like next week, like next week, you could have already had your ads live and customers flooding in. That's what I mean by that. So there's really, really good responses for that specific objection. If the conversation is going round and round in circles, this is what I want you to do. Look, John, here's the thing. Let me let you in on something. You're not really making a decision on us or anyone else running your marketing campaigns. The real decision you're making is whether or not you're prepared to commit to getting your business to X result and the freedom that comes with that, what they really want to do with that money. Super important. It goes back to finding the pain points earlier in the call or whether or not you want to stay exactly where you are, stuck at the same revenue, sick of being overworked, underpaid, not able to afford your finances, whatever the situation is, whatever you've discussed with them at the start of the call, that's the real decision you're making here and you'll be faced with it every day until you're ready to change. So this line of questioning, this sort of statement, it makes the decision about the prospect, getting their dreams and what they really want, fixating them on the outcome and not on you, not on marketing, not on agencies, not on Facebook ads, fixating them on the outcome that they're looking for. And remember, they're not making a decision to invest in Facebook ads, a new funnel, training, services, whatever it may be. They are making a decision on whether or not they want to stay jammed in their current situation or move forward and get what they really, really want out of life. And I know I keep going back to it, find their pain points, dig really, really deep on their pain points and what makes them tick. How to deal with doubt. So, when someone hits you with some skepticism or they hit you with a doubtful statement or you know they're not convinced and you can sense that, I want you to say, look, I totally understand, John, and that's entirely natural. If you weren't having some doubts, you'd probably be a psycho, so it's a good sign. Can I ask a couple of questions to understand this better? Okay, well, first of all, do you actually want this to work for you? Yes. Okay, and if what I've said today is true, do you think it will work? Because you should have built up a really, really good rapport. You should have built up a lot of credibility and he should be saying yes in this certain instance. You're going to say, that's awesome. First of all, I can assure you that I'm speaking the truth and I'm so damn confident this is going to work for you. So shall we try and work through this? Yes. Okay. In my experience, your doubt isn't really doubt. It's just your brain tricking you because it doesn't want you to face the growing pains associated with growth and in your business. Your brain knows your current situation is bearable and familiar and it's scared of change because it's unfamiliar. So whenever someone says they can help you change, you start having doubts because deep down, you're not afraid of it not working, but you're afraid of what might happen if it does work. Now, I don't want to get all psychological on you, but does that make sense or have I misunderstood? And he'll come back and start saying, yeah, I agree. And I'm just worried about what could happen and this, that, and the other. So then John is going to say, yes, that makes sense. And then you're going to say, so can you see how overcoming these doubts and putting some trust in us is exactly what you need to get your business to your desired result? And then he's going to say, yes, hopefully. And then you're going to say, awesome. So can I ask for your vote of trust so we can welcome you to the family?
boom, and then you go in for the close. Reframing questions. So sometimes all you have to do is mirror the prospect's statement back to them to defeat the objection. If their objection are belief based, then the only way to overcome them is by using intelligent reframing questions. For more on this, refer to the objection handling fundamentals lesson where we go through this in great detail. Example, Facebook ads don't work for my business. And you're going to say something like, it sounds like you're having doubts about Facebook ads and that they'll work for you, just so I understand. And he's going to say yes. And then you're going to say, okay, well, how much have you spent on Facebook ads for your business? And he's going to say minimal amount. You're going to ask him, the people who have managed your ads in the past, are they experts with lots of experience? And he's going to say, well, I actually went cheap with a media buyer from the Philippines. And you're going to say, okay, you know, how many audiences have you tried? How much copy have you tested? And they're going to say, well, I don't know. I think they only did one or they weren't very good or I don't believe in them. And then you're going to be pulling back the curtain and be like, look, John, logically speaking here, it sounds like you haven't given Facebook ads a proper run. You know, Facebook ads is the biggest advertising platform in the world. It gets crazy results every single day, not even for my clients, but millions and millions of other client accounts out there. And you're going to ask them questions like, is there a desire for your product? Like, this is a key question. How is their product proven? Do they know that there's a desire in the market for their product? Really, really interesting question on how you can reframe their mindset. To, okay, maybe I need to improve my end. Maybe we need to improve our service, our product in order to give the ads the best chance. So really, really interesting one and a really, really good question to ask and try and reframe them with. So that is it for this lesson. I want you to write down all of the questions and all of the answers so you have them ready for when a potential prospect or a potential client asks you them on a sales call. Some of the answers are really, really great. And we're going to get into other lessons, how we can loop and reframe and keep going round and round and round to logically sell to the client and make them understand that what they're saying actually doesn't make a lot of sense. But this is an incredible foundation for you to hold on to, to for you to learn. So I want you to all write down all of these questions and have them prepared for your first few sales calls. So the price objection, welcome to this lesson. We're going to be talking everything finances, price objection when you get to the end of the call and the client's possibly going to be saying they can't afford it or it's, it's not feasible for them right now. It's going to be slightly common, not too common. Before we even get on the call, we want to be qualifying them through Calendly and through the DMs. But if they get on the call and it's just a little bit pricey for them or whatever the case may be, we want to take them through this process. So let's get into it. The price objection mindset. People will invest wholeheartedly if they believe in the value they receive. Most prospects can't afford your services. Objections often stem from doubt. Address doubts and uncertainties to smash price objections successfully. So what does that mean? That means that most price objections are going to be smoke screens, as we've discussed in previous lessons. I'm going to go through some looping with you soon on how we can actually reframe the mindset of someone who genuinely can't afford our services. But the vast majority of the time, the price objection is going to be a smoke screen. The law of value. Price is often associated with perceived value. Tie your service to specific outcomes rather than just listing features. Focus on how your offering solves their problems or fulfills their desires. Always, always, always focus on the outcome. Discuss this massively and emphasize this massively in previous lessons. We want to emphasize the outcome. What is our service and what are we going to do for the client? How is it going to change their life and their business? Prevention is the key. Follow the script and employ techniques from previous videos to prevent objections. Connect the service to the desired outcomes to minimize price objections. Again, there shouldn't really be price objections if you're following all of the previous lessons. Follow the script and employ all of the techniques to make sure it doesn't happen because the best objection handling prevention technique is to make sure it doesn't happen in the first place. So when they cannot afford, overcome the objection by addressing their financial constraints. If genuinely unable to afford, gracefully explain it's not the right fit at the moment. Stay focused on selling to the right fit for both parties. This is a really, really important one. You don't want to sell to someone for the sake of it or just to get the clothes. And at the start of your agency or if you're just starting out and you're watching this, you will do whatever it takes to get a client on. And that's probably going to be lowering your price or doing whatever they need you to do to get them on board but this could really result in a bad or negative fit which is going to lead to headaches for you down the line so really really important to remember that don't just take a client on for the sake of it taking responsibility for motivation don't rely on prospects being highly motivated focus on making them motivatable assume responsibility for guiding prospects out of doubts and apathy so what does i mean by that do not go into every sales call thinking that the prospect is motivated to work with you actually do the opposite your job is to find their pain points, build rapport, build credibility, and really come across as an absolute killer marketer. And you will do that 
by building confidence with them. That's what you want to do. You want to build confidence and you want to motivate them to work with you. At the end of the sales call, they should be absolutely dying to work with you. That's how good your sales call should be. That's how good your objection ought to be. That's how good your offer and service should be. So keep that in mind. Advanced price positioning and negotiation. Introduce incentive-based pricing with an upfront payment option. Present the pricing pitch as an investment for a specific interval, like 90 days. Offer discounts for quick decisions to create a sense of urgency. So this is, again, using scarcity and things like that to urge the client to make the decision there and then using things like deposits, pricing your services over 90 days as opposed to 30 days, which we're going to get into in later lessons. But introduce incentive-based pricing with an upfront payment option. So if you can make your offer absolutely killer and your pay on results, that is going to be very, very hard to say no to. So bear that in mind. Negotiation with concessions. If the prospect objects to the price, offer a concession to make it more reasonable. Consider breaking up the payment to make it easier for the prospect. Use concessions to knock the wind out of their objection and create a win-win situation. So we're going to get into this now in a second. But essentially what I'm saying by that is at the start, it isn't that bad to drop your pricing just to get a few clients in. That's essentially what I'm saying here. So maybe offer them payment plans or maybe drop your payment down or maybe compromise with them. If your pricing is $1,000 and they can only do 600, meet in the middle at 800, something like that. Negotiation with concessions, that's what I mean by that. And the power of confidence. Aim high during negotiations. It can work in your favor. Reassure the prospect that your offer will deliver results beyond the investment. Emphasize your confidence in the value they'll gain from your service. It is so, so important. You are super confident with your offer. You have to portray that confidence to them. They need to be like ready to run through a brick wall when you tell them how confident you are that this is going to absolutely knock it out of the park for them. Confidence is so, so key. So bear all of that in mind. They're kind of like the fundamentals of the pricing objection. We're going to get into some looping now. So here we are in the Google Doc for price objections. For the purpose of this, I'm going to assume you have diffused the situation right before we get into isolating. So you're going to say, so you're telling me the only reason you're not moving forward is a money issue. Is that correct? And they're going to say yes. And then you're going to say, okay, let's put the money issue to one side. Let's say money wasn't a problem and you had a huge stack of cash in your room. Would working together be of interest to you? If no, you know it's a fear objection. Again, we've discussed this in SEALs lessons before in the job objection handling fundamentals lesson we went into this in great detail how a lot of the time pricing will be a smokescreen so you then go into fear objection looping and reframing however if they say yes and it's a genuine case of they can't afford your services you say something like this okay well in that case i might be able to work something out for you they're going to say yeah and you're going to say okay just so i context what would be your budget as of now they're going to answer and then you're going to say okay how about 30 days from now what could you allocate they're going to answer again and then you're going to say okay and 30 days after that what could you allocate and they're going to answer and then you have a lot of information and then what you're going to do is you're going to make an offer based on your plan b or lower pricing so you should have a plan b pricing the scenario is just like this where the client or potential prospect can't necessarily afford your services so you're going to make an offer based on your plan b pricing and then hopefully they're going to give you a positive response and then you're going to say okay great where do you want to go from here and then you're going to go in for the close so that is how we're going to handle price objections. And hopefully this will really, really increase your conversions when coming up against a price objection. So you've landed a client and now you are onboarding them into your agency. This lesson is on the onboarding process. Really, really crucial lesson to really wrap your head around because a lot of beginners, a lot of people at the start of their agency journey, they do not have a dialed in onboarding process. So I'm going to take you through A to Z exactly how it's going to be done in this lesson. So onboarding outline. Here we have the actual A to Z outline. So the first we're going to invoice them. Hopefully on the call, you're going to invoice them and take payment. And then you're going to do the contract. You're going to do the onboarding form, get them into Slack, get access to their Facebook backend, and then get your team in there. This must be a smooth and efficient process. Really, really important. This needs to be an absolutely dialed in and smooth process. Why is that? Your onboarding process will be the client's first impression of your agency. Make sure it is a good one. Read that again. Make sure it is a good one. It's going to be their very first impression of you as an agency, as a business, how you deal with people. This needs to be absolutely dialed in. So we'll look at the, the outline again. Invoice, contract, form, Slack, access, team. I'm going to go through each individual one and how you do it now in a second. However, that's the process. Invoice them and take payment on the call. Send the contract to be signed. Send them the onboarding form to be filled out. Get them into Slack. Get your access to their Facebook backend. And then you can add your team. They might ask a question like, when will the ads be live? This is a very common question that comes up with clients. Tell the client there is a minimum one week lead time before ads are up. Emphasize there's no point in rushing things. We want quality, not quantity. 
and we want to start as we mean to go on. So really, really important. Tell the client there's a minimum one week lead time when you're starting before the ads will be live. That sets their expectations right from the outset and it doesn't cause any confusion or it doesn't cause any annoyance when they think the ads are going to be a one day and they're not. One week lead time, emphasize there's no point in rushing and we want to start as we mean to go on. So I'm going to go in and share live screens of all of the outline of the onboarding system. So let's get into it. Here we are on the Stripe home screen. You see here the Stripe dashboard. Stripe is what you're gonna be using for all of your business payments and everything related to invoicing and things like that. And this is a completely brand new clean account just to show you what one looks like. I put a pound payment through just to show you how everything looks on their dashboard. This is where you're gonna be looking after your client payments, balances, customers, and you're gonna attach your bank account to Stripe. And that's how you're actually going to be paid money. The customer is gonna pay you through pay funnels, which you can integrate with Stripe, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit about in a minute. But they'll pay you through pay funnels, it'll go through to Stripe, and then Stripe will pay you into your bank account, and that's how you actually get money. So the reason we're gonna use pay funnels is because Stripe does not have an automation tool, like you can't automatically charge customers every single month, which is a complete pain in the ass because you're chasing them, asking them to pay, and asking them to pay, and then if they don't, um, you're not, you've no cash. So we're gonna use pay funnels to integrate with Stripe to automate that. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna come across here to pay funnels. Pay funnels is really, really good. If you create an account, all you have to do to integrate with Stripe is go down here to integration, click on integration, it'll say, do you want to integrate with Stripe? Log into Stripe, you log into Stripe, and then it's really, really simple. So I've just clicked on new invoice and we're gonna do a test invoice. So let's say we're doing one for Facebook ads. We're gonna click that in like that. And this is the key element here. We're not gonna do one time, we're gonna do recurring, which means whatever you put in, your customer will then automatically be charged that payment the same day of the month. So today is the 8th. Next month, the customer will automatically be charged on the 8th this fee. So it's really, really good, really efficient, and means you're not chasing customers. And that is basically it. You can obviously put as much detail in the name of your product or service and then also the description as you want. For the purpose of this test, we're just going to do test invoice on Facebook ads. And then we're going to click save invoice. And then it will actually give you a link like this. You copy the link, come across here. And this is what the link looks like. So you see here, Maverick Socials Limited, monthly recurring, the amount, and all the customer has to do is put in their name, their email, and then their payment details. Really, really simple. It says up here what it is, TS Invoice, Facebook Ads. So really, really simple. That is how you use Stripe and PayFunnels. Very, very simple software to use. So next we're going to go to PandaDoc. This is where all our contracts are going to be created. And to create a contract, all you have to do is come across to here, click on Create New, and it's going to ask you to select a file. Now, I have the template on file, and you want it to be a Word doc. I'm going to attach it to this lesson. You want it to be a Word doc because PDFs sometimes format weirdly. Now, the Word docs will format weirdly as well, but they're a lot easier to sort of mend. So you click or you drag it up and it will convert and then you want to click convert and that will process and then here is where you're going to put in the client information so for the purpose of this let's put in john at nike.com let's do john smith and then we're going to hit continue and then this will auto populate the contract for us and then you can see here it is now auto populated. Now there are some issues here. You can see the numbers haven't populated correctly for whatever reason. Sometimes it does doesn't go in correctly. So all you have to do is go in and change that. It's very, very simple. You just put in one, two, three, four, five for all the services. But because this is populated now, we can make whatever changes. So you can put in the date, you can put in the name, the company, or whoever it may be. You can scroll down, you can obviously change the service deliverables change the numbers as we said, and then you can change these two. So if we scroll down and we want to change this to, let's say two, nine, nine, five, or whatever it may be, you can change it however you see fit. And then if we scroll down here, the important bit is this. So if we go to the company name, we can put in a text field where the client has to fill that out. So let's say, so I've now asked John to fill that out. So he puts his company name in there. Below that, you can put the signature. Boom, we just assign that to John. Boom, there we go. Company name, value, and then John can put his signature. 
And that is essentially how you use PandaDoc. It's really, really simple. Once you get used to it, you will love it. It's very, very efficient. And every time you sign a contract or every time you have a client that needs to sign a contract, this is what you're gonna use. So again, some small formatting issues here. These are easy to fix. Um, but yeah, really, really good. I'm going to attach this to this lesson. So you have this contract template, but this is what you're gonna be using for your contract agreements. And all you have to do is go up here and click send when it's ready to go. You go up and click send and you can send it via an email or what I like to do, I share via link. And we're just gonna name this marketing contract. You wanna click generate links. And then it's generating. And then boom, you just copy that link and you send it to John or your client or whoever it may be. And they will just click on that link and it will pop up PandaDocs for them and they can sign the contract. So that is the contracts on PandaDoc. So now we're going to look at the onboarding form. And this is done on Google Forms. And I highly, highly recommend you go and create a Google Workspace account and start using Google Docs, Google Forms, Google Sheets, all that good stuff. And this is what it like. I'm going to attach this to the bottom of the document too. But this is what the Google Form looks like. So we're asking the business name, daily ad budget, website URLs, Google link with existing creatives, confirming that they've uploaded that, locations, countries that they target, and all really, really vital information for us. And there'll be more on the following page as well. And I'm going to attach this to the bottom of the lesson. And all you wanna do is you wanna go over to Google Forms and you wanna simply click on Create New. And it will take you to this page where you can easily create a Google Form just like the one I have. You can copy the exact one if you want, I do not mind. And you go ahead and you collect the information from the client by creating a form here, really, really simple. And that is the form aspect of the onboarding process. So here we are on the Facebook homepage and I'm going to show you how to get access to the client account. So what I actually recommend you doing is creating a short Loom video, just like the one I'm about to show you now and giving it to the client. So you can create like a general one and you can send it to every client after they onboard to show them how to give you access to their Facebook ads. So what you wanna do is you wanna go over here to the left and click on Ads Manager, and that is gonna take you across to the Ads Manager dashboard. Once you are here, you wanna click these three horizontal lines and you wanna to go to Business Settings. Once you're in Business Settings, here we can see the backend settings dashboard on Facebook Business Suite. And what you wanna do is you wanna go over to Add People. Let's use the similar example from earlier. So this will be the client inputting your email. This will be the client inputting your email to give you access. And you essentially want to get admin access. There you go, you click everything and then manage, and then you go to next. And then we click everything. And then we go down to ad accounts and we click manage ad accounts. And then we go to pixels. Well, there's not a pixel set up, but if there was, then we would click add. This is a fresh new account just to show you. And then we go over here, everything. So you just wanna go through everything, make sure everything is selected. Here we go, pages, you wanna click everything, everything, everything to show the client what to do. Because once you have admin access, then you can add your team members, you can add pixels, you can add tracking events. You want to have admin access because if you don't have admin access, you're gonna to have to go back to the client and ask them for access every time you need them. And that's not what you want. You want admin access so it's just efficient you can do everything yourself on the back end nine times out of ten the client will have no issue with that and they'll give you access if they do you can just explain to them exactly how i just explained it to you that you need access so you're not annoying them every five minutes for access to things so that is the onboarding process watch this video in depth learn it and make sure your onboarding process is a well-oiled machine Welcome to this lesson on how to create your Calendly form. So this is really, really important that you set up your Calendly form correctly and you ask the right questions to the client to prevent you getting on calls with people who are not qualified. So when you create your account, you simply go to create event and it'll bring you to a page like this and you wanna to go to a one-on-one -on -one event. I'm gonna be the host and you're gonna call this event, whatever your agency is called. Let's say it's John Smith Digital Strategy Call. We're gonna add a location, which is gonna be Zoom. If this is not popping up, you simply need to go and integrate Zoom by clicking this, click integrations, and then go and integrate your Zoom account. Really, really easy, but that's how you do it, and it will then pop up automatically. This is not important. You can put in some information like, on this consultation call, we will discuss the best way to grow your business or something like that. 
really, really not important. Then this is the URL, not massively important either. And then you're gonna have your event color and then we are gonna click on next. So the date range, this means how far in the future can the client book or the potential client. I like to have this as three because if it's any more than three, they're more likely to forget about the call or something else will come up or someone else will close them. So I like to put this as three calendar days, which means if it's Monday, they can book no later than Thursday. Then we'll put this to 60 minutes. And then down here is where you can set your hours. So obviously this is completely personal to everyone. You go over here to set custom hours and then you can mess around with this and set the hours that you want where you're going to be available to take calls for your agency. And then we're gonna click next. So then the event is created and you can share your link and call the URL. But what we're gonna to go to next is invitee questions. So obviously their name and email is really, really important, but we want to ask some other questions. So let's put in, let's put in that and then let's put in multiple lines and let's make sure it's required. So they cannot book a call without answering this question. So what do you hope to gain from this call? Boom, apply. Then we're gonna add another question like what are you currently doing for marketing good question to ask let's do multiple lines on that which essentially means they can write in a paragraph or two and we'll apply and then this is a really really crucial question so what is your monthly marketing budget so it's a good question to ask and we want to put that as required because we're not outright saying to them, okay, do you have enough money to pay for me? Do you have enough money for my services? We're just asking them, you know, what is your monthly marketing budget? It's a very, very relevant question and something that you are well within your rights to ask. But from your perspective, before they book on or before you have the call, you'd be able to see. And if they say their monthly marketing budget is $500, which means they have $500 for ad spend and for your service fee, then you're not a good fit. This company is simply not ready for Facebook ads or Google ads, whatever it may be and they're not fit. So you know you don't even have to take the call. You can cancel the call, you can email the person. Thank you very much for your time, but based on your monthly marketing budget, I don't think we're gonna be a good fit. Leave it at that. You don't waste 60 minutes going through everything with this guy, trying to close him when he just can't be closed because he's not a good fit. So we have their name, email, what do you hope to gain from this call? What are you currently doing for your marketing? What is your monthly marketing budget? And that's pretty much, if I was going to add in anyone else, I would add in phone number just so you can WhatsApp them. And then you go down and you click phone number and that will put in international codes and everything for that. So you can WhatsApp them before the call, add a bit of rapport on WhatsApp before they even get there and improve show up rates. You could add in more questions. You could add in something like, have you ever run Facebook ads before? And what do you hope to achieve in the next six to 12 months? What are your goals? But I think that's overcomplicating it. I think that will put some people off because people get annoyed when they have to fill out big forms. So I think name, email, what do you hope to gain from this call? What are you currently doing for marketing? What is your monthly marketing budget? And phone number is perfect for now. Then you go over to save and close. And then you will be able to see this on the page. So we go to view live page. You know, obviously you're gonna add your logo. That's my logo. You're gonna go to JS Digital Strategy Call. We click in here, we go to this, and then boom, we have all our questions. Name, email, what do you hope to gain from this call? What are you currently doing for marketing? What is your monthly marketing budget and phone number? Perfect, that's everything we need. We'll get their phone number, we'll get a feel for their current situation, we'll get a feel for their marketing budget, and we have everything we need in order to qualify them for this call. And if their marketing budget, as I say, is too low, don't be afraid to cancel the call and say to them, look, I don't think you're a good fit. Or you can take the call just for some sales experience, just to get a feel for getting on sales calls. It's totally up to you but this gives you the scope of the situation and this gives you all the information you need at your disposal. So that is how we set up Calendly and I will see you in the next lesson. What is going on everyone, Dylan again, and I hope you found that video valuable. I hope you found it useful. I want to tell you about my free community, Agency Accelerator Free. This is a free community on school that is literally giving away the most insane amount of value completely free of charge. And if you go into the community, you will see here, there is so much going on here. Um, but if you are an existing or new agency owner and you wanna scale your agency, there is not a better free resource in the market. If we go into the course here, the Agency Accelerator course, you can see the amount of lessons and value in here. Like it is just insane. All of this, over 200 lessons, completely for free. So if you are looking to scale your agency, if you're looking to get to 10K per month in the next 90 to 120 days, Check out Agency Accelerator free. It's linked below underneath the video and I hope to see you inside.